call this meeting to order. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Um, where am I? Oh, here I am, this time. Speaker, I'd just like to introduce two great uh, counselor for the day. As you know, Withrow School, there's always every year, uh, students come and they are counselor for the day. And this year, we are, have the pleasure of having with us counselor Lachlan Curry and counselor Zaid Rashid. And here they are, up in the council chambers. They've met the mayor and they're learning everything there is to learn about City Hall. So thank you for welcoming them today to our meeting. Thank you. Okay, okay members of council, uh, before the recess, council was debating the mayor's key uh, matter, item EX 6.5 on a status update, Toronto, Ontario Transit Responsibilities Realignment Review. We will return to that item after the release of Member Holtz. Do we have any releases of Member Holtz? Put your name in the middle, yeah, request a question. The mic is, uh, it's, it's here. Huh? The microphone has been repositioned by the... Oh. <laughs> no charge. Was somebody sitting here? <laughs> um, Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Uh Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, page 4, EX 6.25. Not fair in the air, excessive air traffic noise over Don Mills. I'm happy to release that. All right, well, then I'll continue to hold it. Okay. I, I have more. Oh, okay. Well, come on, man. Well, um, Page 5, CA 7.4, appointment of public members tr to the Toronto Parking Authority. Uh, staff have helped me draft a motion, if they can put it up. This is technical more than anything else. It's the committee recommendations plus uh, changing the date to July the 1st. Okay, so on page 5, CA 7.4, the yeah. amendment is on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Uh, Item is amended on favor. Carried. Easy. Okay. Do you have another one? I do. I was distracted by my uh, seatmate here for a moment. Uh, striking Committee, ST 2.1, on page 8, Council Member Appointments to the Toronto Parking Authority. No, excuse me. ST 2.2, Council Member Appointments to Council Advisory Bodies. Um, I think we ha there are a number of motions here. Can staff put, it, put, it, put them up? Well, I, I've got Councillor Cressy that held it down. Oh, we've kind of negotiated. Oh, you're releasing it? Okay. Okay, I th we have some motions, yes? Thank you. Okay, uh, so the motion is to put Councillor McKelvey, McKelvey down. Whoops. All right, there you go. There's the first one, uh, which I've spoken to the councillors about this. They're fine with this. And the second one, uh, can't put Councillor McKelvey on the chair of the Film, Television, and Digital Media Advisory Board. And then because of that, she gets to go on the Toronto Francophone Affairs Advisory Committee. All right, thank you. Thank you, Count. We should all thank Councillor McKelvey for uh, taking on that responsibility. I believe that's all of them. Au revoir. <laughs> okay. Okay, so on, on page 8, uh, ST 2.2, um, the amendment, you, you want to hold it? Okay. All right. Councillor Karajianis. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to release uh, IE 5.10 Management of Solid Waste Contracts. What page, uh, 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 sorry, page 7, under transformation to uh, full extended producer responsibility model. Okay. 
Do we have another one to release? Okay, hold on. Okay, Councillor Robinson has shown in. I'll keep holding it then. Okay. I'll keep holding it. All right, okay. Yes. I'll hold it. Madam uh, Speaker, on page 8, PH 6.12, I do have a motion that I ask staff to, uh, if they can. Uh, okay, that's fine. I'll keep holding it. Councillor Fillion. Say hello to Chris Korn Kaczynski for me, will you? Councillor Perks, please. That that was an inappropriate comment. Yeah. Wow. Well, Councillor Perks, can yes. you please retract that comment? Why? Well, I don't want him to say. You are concerned about speaker. I think we're all concerned. You mentioned an, an individual's name when Councillor. A registered lobbyist on yes. this, yes. Yes. So I did mention that. Yes. Can you withdraw that comment? I. Sorry. So what? Withdraw the comment, please. He just said to say hi. Okay. Yes. I withdraw it. Don't say hello. <laughs> Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you. On page uh, 8, NY 6.3, the staff have submitted a supplementary report, so I'm moving the recommendations in the supplementary report. I think staff will put them on the screen. Yep. On page 8, NY 6.3, you do have a supplementary report. Councillor Filling is moving the supplementary report. All in favor? Carried. Item is amended on favor carried. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I'd like to release page 11, TE 6.52, and move the recommendations in the report, please. Okay, on page 11, Councillor Bradford is releasing TE 6.52. Recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Perks, Councillor Robinson, and Councillor Peruzza. Mayor Tory, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Executive Committee uh, EX 6.11, City of Toronto Corporate Asset Management Policy. I can release that. Okay, on page 4, EX 6.11, Councillor Ainsley is releasing. On favour, carried. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I have three, three things to do. The first on page 4 is to release EX 6.10, Impact of Provincial Announcement on City's 2019 budget and budget process. Okay, on page 4, EX 6.10, Councillor Layton is releasing. On favour, carried. The second one is uh, I need to reconsider item TE 6.31. What page was uh, that? I, I'm sorry, it, I, d I don't have the number here. 6.31 would be on page 11. Sorry, TE 6.61, road safety. That's on fleet. No, you're on page 10. 31 three is on page 10. Sorry, construction staging area, 342 Davenport, and I have uh, an amendment. Okay, just a sec. Let me find the number. What number? Um, 31? 
Okay, construction uh, staging for 342-46 Davenport. Okay, Councillor, so you would like that to, to be reopened? Councillor yes. Layton? Yes. Okay. Okay, all in favor of reopening? Carried. Okay, Councillor Layton? And then there's an amendment. Okay. The amendment is on the screen. All in favor of the amendment? Carried. And I have one last item to deal with. Now, and hold on, hold on, Councilor Lane. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. Yes? Thank you very much. My, my apologies. On page uh, 10, no, on page 9, I need to, to move to reopen, reconsider TE 6.5, 8 Elm, and 348, 356 Young Street. Staff have informed me they have uh, alternative, uh, alternative direction that we need to give them. On page 96.5, Councillor Layton is reopening. On favor? Carried. I don't yet have that alternative direction. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson. Oh, I did not. Yeah, no, sorry. Thank you, Speaker. Um, page number six, uh, EC 5.8, grants to specialized um, collection museum, 2019 allocation. I have a motion for that item. Okay, on page six, EC 5.8. You have an amendment? Uh, yes. And it's on the screen. Basically, I'm just asking for us to be able to uh, have some more uh, measurements and assessment on the uh, resources that these uh, particular organizations are spending. Um, there is a second one as well for 5-9, which is similar. I'd like to ask for a recorded vote on this one as well. Okay. No, I'll hold on to it. If you have questions, that's fine. Yeah. So it's not a quick item, so. Okay. Do you do you have a question on the second one as well? It's similar motion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I'll hold it on. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank, thank you. you yeah. Councilor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On page ten, I would ask that we reopen TE six point three four construction staging area three nineteen to three twenty three Jarvis Street. Uh, I do have uh, an amendment to place uh, before council. Which uh, which uh, item number? Uh, it's, is it's on page ten. Uh, TE six point three four construction staging area three nineteen to three twenty three Jarvis Street. Okay, so on page ten, uh, TE six point three four, Council Wong Tam is asking to reopen. All in favor? Carried. And now, Madam Speaker, I'd like to place the, uh, the amendment from staff. Okay, the amendment is on the screen. On favor, <laughs> carried. Thank you. Item is amended, on favor, carried. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just bear with me while I find the item. Bottom of page five, EC 5.7, Local Arts Service Organizations, 2019 grant allocations. Prepare to release that. Okay, on page five, EC 5.7, Councillor Holiday is releasing recorded vote. No, thank you. Councillor Bradford, please. Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Okay.
We do have some motions that um, that we'll introduce. Councillor Cressy. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is urgent as the placard deadline for objections was June 12th. Okay, on favor, carried. Councillor Cressy, you have another one? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is urgent in order to allow the Section 37 to be finalized uh, to allow the project to proceed. On um, favor, carry. Councillor Crawford. Councillor Fillion, can you introduce this on behalf of Councillor Crawford? Uh, yes. Okay, it's on the screen. On um, favor, carried. Councillor Cole. I see it. Yes, uh, given the uh, fact that uh, we want to get uh, this study done to see what the impact is of the uh, increased speeds on the 400 series of highways running through the city, and we want to have a plan in place to deal with this in the September start of the new school year. It's okay, uh, urgent. Thank you. On um, favor, carried. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. This is uh, an urgent, uh, urgent uh, motion uh, because of an ongoing construction of a residential project uh, in Ward 6 and the relief is uh, needed immediately in order for them to continue uh, with their project. All in favor, carried. Councillor Ford. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion to add. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this motion is urgent as a deadline for the City of Toronto to appeal to the committee's decision on June 26, 2019. On favor, carried. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this motion is to revise the previous council instruction, and the uh, reason for the urgency is that. Uh, the tribunal hearing for the matter is actually scheduled for July 24th, if I may just, uh, there was a little bit of a glitch, mistake, July 24th. Yeah. So if we can amend that okay. date to July 24th. Okay, all in favor, carry. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, this matter is urgent because the uh, St. Lawrence uh, Market BIA uh, would like to see the, uh, the, the mural improvements for Farquhar's Lane happening this uh, summer, and we need to release those funds. On um, favor, carried. Okay, Mayor Tory, can you introduce this on, on behalf of Councillor Barlow? Yes, now I don't have it uh, in front of me, Madam Speaker. Oh, there it is, all right. Now I have to put on my glasses to see it. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so this arises out of uh, um, a uh, uh, attendance that uh, Councillor Bylaw and I had in uh, Vancouver, as well as a staff member, and it's urgent because the homeless uh, situation requires that if we can possibly deploy this modular housing, uh, we should do so as quickly as possible. Okay, all in favor, carried. Okay, that's it. So we'll now go to the item. And I believe we still had some questions. I think Councillor Peruzza was next on the list, but we'll wait until the uh, screen comes up. Councillor Peruzza, questions? Councillor Peruzza. I'm sorry, madam. 
Speaker? You're, you put your name up to ask questions. Uh, oh, right. With the, we're going back to the, um, uh, to the uh, transit, um, yeah. provincial, yeah. okay, okay, sure. I, I did, I'd had some, uh, some questions. I'm not sure who to ask the questions of, uh, but I just wanted to, to uh, go back to uh, the uh, funding for these projects. So the Scarborough subway, the one-stop Scarborough subway, um, how is that being funded? I'm actually going to write this down, okay? Yes. Through the speaker, uh, right now in the budget, there is $660 million that is assumed to be coming from the federal funding public transit infrastructure fund, phase two. There is, and I might need finance staff to correct me, approximately $900 uh, million that's currently in budget around development charges, property tax increase. And then there is um, a provincial contribution of $1.48 billion in 2010 dollars, which is escalated to $199 billion, which is the previous contribution to the Scarborough LRT that was reallocated to the Scarborough subway. Okay, so, so the Scarborough subway um, has uh, s uh, some funding allocated to it. So the 660 uh, federal money, it's not, it's not money in the bank yet. It's just simply a promissory note from the feds, correct? The federal government has um, previously made announcements uh, notionally committed no, no, I understand, committing but to they it. haven't cut the check yet, right? Yeah, there's no transfer okay, payment agreement. Perfect. Um, okay, so, um, so that's, that's with the Scarborough subway. So I add, up, I add that up to be uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $2.5 uh, the one-stop Scarborough subway, the price tag on that is considerably higher though, correct? No, there's a, there's a $3.56 billion budget that is fully funded. Um, it should be 199 provincial. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, okay. Uh, 660 federal, and then the balance is city, and it's a mix of property tax, um, increase in development charges. Okay, so now the change to a three-stop uh, subway. Um, what, what does that do? So in terms of the incremental cost to a three-stop, that's actually something that's subject to ongoing discussion with the province as part of the, uh, the cost-sharing discussions. Okay. Uh, so, so now that the, that the province is taking over the project, uh, do the, the, uh, is the, the one-stop uh, Scarborough funding arrangement, uh, is that still on the table? Is that um, so we're still all committed to that uh, in the same way, money-wise? Like the, the, the $900 uh, million that comes through our development charges, our dedicated property tax increase, all of that stuff. So that just kind of sort of goes from wh whatever we were doing uh, to, uh, to, I guess we, we cut a check to, the, to Metrolinx for that? So that's something that is certainly a topic of conversation with the province. There's no commitment yet that there is a city contribution to that project. It's part of the ongoing discussions with the province. Okay, so, so technically our $900 million, we kind of sort of pulled it back a bit and said, okay, now we need to talk about it because you have changed the project. Uh, the delivery agent for the project has changed. Uh, so that's a decision that we're going to have to uh, make another day, correct? Yes, when there's a when there's a report back, you will need to. I wanted lay out. to. I just yeah. yeah. I just wanted to. Um, uh, thanks for filling in that blank. Uh, so how much have we? No, no, I'm not finished yet. Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of others, right? Okay. And, um, uh, that's right. I want to get to it quick. So how much have we already uh, uh, sort of um, sunk into the one-stop Scarborough subway for all the work that we've done? The EAs, the, some of the design, uh, some of the boreholes, all of that stuff. So Assembling the teams, uh, paying for the staff. Um, so over 200 million I've been advised. 200 million so far, okay. Um, good. The Ontario line, what would, be the, what would be the split in funding the Ontario line? So that's also subject to discussion with the province as part What's of the, the provincial expectation so far? So, sorry, Tracy, did you want to? 
so through you, Madam Speaker, it's, it's a little preemptive right now at this point, Councillor Peruzza, to speak about cost sharing. As Karen's indicated, but once they, we have they, further they, detail. Didn't they say one third, one third, one third, more or less? Uh, no, there was, there's been a number of things said in the public domain in this respect, but the discussions around go forward, cost sharing, funding, et cetera, are all parts of the discussions we're having at various tables. Okay, that was your, la that was your last question. No, that was your last, uh, last question, um, Councillor Peruzza, sorry. Um, that was your last question. Councillor Perks. Speaker, on a point of privilege, uh, a moment ago, uh, I made a comment in reference to uh, Councillor Karajanis's attempt to withdraw item PH 6.12, Area Specific Amendment to the Sign Bylaw 2904 Shepherd Avenue East. Uh, you asked me to withdraw my suggestion that Councillor Karajanis say hello to Chris Korn Kaczynski. Because I was uncertain of my facts, I agreed to withdraw that, but I've since gone and checked my facts. On June, on June 13th, Councillor uh, Karajanis was contacted by Mr. Korn Kaczynski on subject matter 28142, which is the sign variance proposal for the same address, 2904 Shepherd Avenue. I would suggest further that you shouldn't be surprised by this because Mr. Korn Kaczynski contacted you on June 12, 2019. So given that, no, I am not withdrawing my remark. Do say hello to Mr. Korn Kaczynski for me, Councillor Karajanis. Councillor Karajanis. Madam Chair, um, who we meet and who we don't meet is public record, and sometimes we, that's on the record. But however, I think my good friend, Councillor Perks, was saying this in a tan and cheek uh, fashion it was inappropriate to say say hello. I don't think it was appropriately called, and certainly to bring to point out who you met with and who you haven't met with. It's I don't think this has got nothing to do with it. He made a remark. You asked him to withdraw it. He withdrew it, and I don't even understand why he's coming back at it again. Okay, let's just okay. Let's move on. Councillor Matlow to speak. I have a motion, and it's uh, the motion that I moved um, when we first uh, discussed uh, venturing into these uh, uh, so-called consultations with the province. And my motion is in two part. One is that we talk about what we want to talk about, which is providing great transit for uh, Torontonians in the region. But we should not be, in my view, suckered in to a so-called negotiating table that has nothing to do with improving our city or really listening to council's position. What it is, is that we have a government that unilaterally made an announcement. They said, we're gonna do this. They announced the uh, bill, they moved the bill, they approved the bill. They haven't consulted with us about what they wanna do. They've already said, they're taking our subway. They're taking our assets. They wanna know the value. But just because you announce that you're going to take over the subway doesn't mean that it's easy to do. It's really complex. They need to understand not only the values, but even how to disconnect all the feeder lines. It's, it's complex because it's an interwoven system. And what I'm concerned about is that this is a Trojan horse, that what they want to do, I mean, they're asking, you heard earlier, they're asking for even details like, like, like uh, owner manuals for some of the cars. They want to understand every detail they can to be able to implement uh, what they've decided to move forward with. They don't actually care about our opinion. If they cared about our opinion, they would have not only uh, uh, consulted with us first, they would have met with the mayor and you know, leaders in our, in our public service before they moved the legislation in a, in, a, in, a, in a substantive and genuine way. They would have said, this is where we'd like to go, but we'd like to talk with you first. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. So we also, uh, as a council, decided that we had 61 questions, really important questions. I would submit we probably have more than that. And we heard from Tracy earlier, Ms. Cook rather, that uh, uh, we don't have any real answers yet. Maybe we'll get answers, we're hoping for answers, but we don't really have answers. This is a one-sided discussion. We're being told what's gonna happen. We're not being asked 
what should happen. So um, there are areas of the plan that look interesting to me. I mean, the Ontario line, if it genuinely can be built quicker and provide relief to our system, I don't want to block that. I, I'm interested to see where that discussion is going to go. I still don't fully understand why it leads to Ontario Place, but the concept is supportable. We need to know more about it. We need to know even more defined answers about what the technology will be. I don't know all those answers yet, but I want it. Um, there are aspects of the plan that seem to be complete nonsense. Uh, some of it seems to be kind of uh, some of it seems to be expert driven, other parts of it seems to be very politically driven. But they're not working with us. So I hope you will support a motion that supports Council's position. Council said we want to have answers to our questions to know if we're going to be there with a good faith partner. I see no evidence that they're a good faith partner. I didn't see that with our local elections. When they unilaterally ripped up our elections in the middle of the election. I didn't see that with the public health and child care cuts when they unilaterally announced it. And it was only because of the leadership of the mayor and Councillor Cressy and others that they capitulated to public pressure that helped lead the way. I've seen them do this over and over and over again. I don't see that we've got a partner. Um, if I've seen any evidence, if I would have seen any evidence that they genuinely want us at the table to actually create a vision with us, then I'd want to stay at the table because I think it's worth our time to insert our knowledge and expertise uh, and on the ground experience to be able to move our city forward with them. But that's not who we're dealing with and you know that. I mean, you know that. This is why Doug Ford gets booed everywhere he goes because it's broken trust. Like every sector is, is upset at him now because they don't feel like he, he and his government deal with them in, in good faith. By the way, I would go the same with one, uh, Bill 108, ripping up Midtown and Focus, ripping up the downtown plan. They're not doing things with us, they're doing things at us. What I'm concerned again is that if we remain at the table, sort of like uh, you know, uh, uh, the better poker player will always win, when they just keep looking for signs, are we, what cards do we have? What do they need from us? Do they need to understand how to dismantle the system a little better? Maybe we'll share that information with them. Uh, do they need to understand the values of what they're going to sell off? Yeah. Thank let's, you. Let's walk away from a table that we were not genuinely invited in in partnership. Thank you. Councillor Cole. I think I have a motion, uh, Madam Speaker. I can put it up on the screen. That given the province has not shared with the City of Toronto staff and the Toronto Transit Commission the new technology the province will deploy on the proposed $10.9 billion Ontario Relief Line, City Council requests the Deputy City Manager, Infrastructure and Development Services, to report to the Executive Committee on the possible delays in the construction of the relief line and the strategies and plans needed to deal with the continued overcrowding on the Young Line that may be caused by those delays. Uh, my main concern here is a very practical one. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, if you try and get on the uh, Young Line at Eglinton any morning, uh, you have to wait five, six subway cars. You're jammed right to the walls. You cannot get on unless you wait for five, six, seven cars. In fact, as I've said before, many residents are now going to Young and Eglinton at the station to go south, they must go north towards Finch and then get off at Lawrence or get off at Yorkville, then come south. That's how crazy it's getting. So I am afraid that this uncertainty as a result of the uh, new provincial uh, plans for Toronto is going to further delay the building of the much needed uh, downtown relief line. Because, you know, when I saw earlier, uh, one of the staff members mentioned uh, that we have done 15% of the preliminary engineering work on our downtown relief line plan. They've only done 2% on the mystery downtown, or whatever they call it, the Ontario uh, line. They've only done 2%. So that, that means that there's delay. So I'm worried that we need to start thinking about an alternative way of dealing with the overcrowding on the Young Line before someone gets seriously hurt. 
we need to uh, uh, somehow find a way of dealing with this reality because not only is there uncertainty as a result of the downtown relief line being pushed aside by the new mystery line that goes from uh, Eglinton, uh, the uh, Science Center down to Ontario Place and beyond, uh, but we've also lost a billion dollars towards our maintenance and state of good repair budget. That compounds the problem because part of that money in the one billion dollars would have gone towards enhancing our maintenance yards to provide for more trains to be put on the uh, young line to relieve the pressure. Now we can't add the new train, extra trains to relieve the pressure because the province cut a billion dollars of our state of good repair. So we get it two ways. We've got this mysterious line that they refuse to talk about. We don't know the technology. And remember, that new mystery line uh, is going to break the whole tradition of Toronto's seamless integrated system. That's gone. Because now the new mystery line is going to interface with the LRT line, different trains, different platforms, different stations. Then it's going to interface with the traditional heavy rail subway system, <coughs> different, uh, again, track level, uh, track width. The width of the tracks are going to be different. How are you going to plan to build the new maintenance yards for the new mystery technology? How are you going to interface the new stations with the existing uh, stations on the new LRT line at Eglinton, on the uh, Bloor-Danforth line? How is this going to happen? We don't know because they're hiding the mystery technology from TTC. They're hiding it from our chief uh, general manager. So my motion here tries to get us to now deal with this very critical situation of dealing with the uh, overcrowding on the young line because it looks like, folks, there's going to be no relief in the next 10 years. While they keep uh, playing games with uh, uh, transportation in Toronto. So we need to start directing ourselves to the reality of the delays that are going to come and how we get people on and off the uh, young line, especially in the core of the city, which is right now at a critical stage of being over capacity. So let's start looking at alternatives. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Bradford. Councillor Fillion, are you here? Councillor Fillion. Um, thank you. Um, just want to speak briefly in favor of both Councillor Coles and Councillor Matlow's motions. Um, on Councillor Cole's motion, I think it's pretty clear that the province plans to build the Young Line in advance of the uh, Ontario Line, um, whether intentionally or not. Um, you know, the the uh, mystery line, as Councillor Cole calls it, is you know, I don't think there's anything there yet. And, uh, you know, that's going to take years and years. Um, and the, uh, the Young Line North is far more advanced, and uh, clearly that would happen first if we don't do something about it. They're not going to build it and then not open it. Um, so, you know, that would um, be not just uncomfortable, but unsafe if that line were to open first and also would, um, you know, would seriously discourage people from taking public transit because it would be unsafe and uncomfortable. So uh, that is a really serious possibility that we cannot allow to happen, whatever we need to do to prevent it. And um, on Councillor um, uh, Matlow's motion, uh, clearly there, um, as, as he said, they don't, this isn't any kind of a sincere dialogue or exchange of information. 
their uh, casing the joint and uh, you know why yeah. we would invite them yeah. in to let them do that uh, is beyond me so I'll be uh, supporting not uh, cooperating that exactly way right. thank you councillor Bradford thanks very much madam speaker I'd have a motion I'd like to move just a two-parter um, it, I've had a chance to speak with staff about this, uh, both our city manager and the TTC as well as uh, transportation planning. Um, and I, I just want to start by saying we've been here a few times, uh, even early, early days in this term, the first six months, we continue to have conversations about changes in our transit plan, our transit network plan, and that interface with the province. And many of my colleagues here, many of you have been through this uh, for, for years, for term after term after term. and. Uh, we're at, we're at another moment where we have an update report and new information is presented, but we're still left with many questions. Um, for me, it's about moving forward with the relief line as quickly as possible. And as we heard from the questions today and the answers from staff, the City of Toronto is actually significantly further along in the planning, design, and procurement for a relief line than the Ontario line. And that's a 15% complete versus a 2% complete. Now, admittedly, the Ontario line is, is just getting started, and, and that's, that's a new announcement and something that hasn't had a lot of time uh, to be developed. But we have put in the time, we have put in the money and the energy on the relief line, and we should be advancing that forward. So I think the most important transit priority, not only for Toronto and the TTC, uh, but actually, in fact, the entire region is that relief line. And we need to consider every option to speed up that work. As we heard from questioning, there are still many questions that remain unanswered from the province. We don't have a commitment that the province will actually pay for the cost of tearing up the plans that we spent years putting in place. We've had to put on hold all of the work that we've been doing to accelerate the relief line for the past two years. Uh, we have had little indication on what will happen to the planning around the stations as the province moves forward uh, with a variety of other pieces of legislation as it relates to MTSAs. And we're not clear about how many of the changes being proposed affect our transit network here at the City of Toronto. And it's that last point uh, that really is the subject of the motion that I'm bringing forward to you. So the first recommendation is pretty straightforward. We should be asking the province to move forward on the central section as identified in the report, the central section of the proposed Ontario line, in so much as it's effectively in alignment uh, with what we're proposing for the relief line. So we should be making a push on that. We've done a significant amount of work on that portion of the project. We've found new ways to shave two years off that timeline, and we have an EA in place. So you know, I want us to urge the province, at the very least, to get the shovels in the ground on that section of the line, finding ways to compress the schedule uh, so that we can move forward in par parallel rather than doing the whole thing sequentially. Uh, that's only going to slow us down. The second part of the recommendation does two things. Uh, one, we're giving staff direction to ensure that we're actually negotiating with the pr province for a position that gives priority to our transit network plan. Uh, as the City of Toronto, we have a responsibility to advocate for our transit priorities and the priorities in the plan. Uh, and the second part asks for staff to really quantify how any new plans coming forward from the province will actually affect the transit network that we have here in place for Torontonians. So the modeling should look at how the network is used um, with respect to our existing plan and compare that how it would be used under any other changes made by the province. Uh, and asking questions like are we getting the, the biggest growth uh, in ridership for Torontonians or are we watering down our network uh, beyond to the region. So I don't think, you know, any, we don't have any decisions in front of us here today. It's an update report. But this is the kind of information that I think as councillors, as Torontonians, uh, we actually need to make informed decisions on our transit planning going forward. Uh, and of course we need to do everything we can to speed up work on the relief line or the Ontario line, whatever we can do to, to make that connection and provide some relief though. So hope you'll consider supporting my motion and uh, thank you very much Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, you were here a minute ago. Huh? She removed her name. She took, no, her name is. She took her yeah. name off? You went past her. She didn't take her name off. I think she did no, subsequently. She, she was her here. Councillor Carroll. 
Councillor Carroll. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, if, if you don't mind, I'll just speak from here. I'm putting my iPad on here. I don't know if, how well that, uh, that shows to uh, folks that are streaming. But the reason I put this on is it, it speaks to Councillor Cole's motion, um, and it speaks to the questions that I was asking earlier about vehicle work in the base system. Uh, uh, CEO, TTC CEO uh, uh, Rick Leary and I were just chatting about what was adopted at TTC under Chair Robinson last week, uh, the, the, uh, the draft guidelines to begin really uh, putting in place a hard five and ten year plan. What is our action plan for the next decade? And it, it uh, reminds me of the comments that Councillor Cole made in support of his motion except that the second part of his motion is that, that item, in my mind, that we adopted at TTC, which is a five-year plan. And if you, if you have a look at the TTC's website, you'll find that within that plan, and in the presentation that was given, there is a lot of focus on our bus network. And it really is because of what Councillor Cole has said. At the rate these conversations are going, if we look at the catalog of, of new lines that have actually been uh, had the brakes put on them by starting this ownership conversation, you know that we run the risk of no substantial new lines actually happening for 10 years, which means that the system that exists today is going to have to do the work of the next decade. And so we've got to max it out. We've got to squeeze every bit of performance out of the networks that we do have while well, this is all being decided upon and then the projects restarted and even if they're expedited having nothing new to ride on for at least a decade unless we can convince them in the short term that their best bet is to pick up those studies that we've already done and work with what we've already done and move with those if you don't it's a long time before we're writing anything new. What you see on the screen, Madam Speaker, is taken from the plan that we looked at at budget time in the TTC. And what you're looking at, where I say, say vehicle acquisitions, that's just what's needed to function normally for 10 years and deal with average ridership growth. Average ridership growth. Those are the types of things that it takes to run the system we already own. And I don't think that this province has wrapped its head around that because they don't operate a system anything like it. You can't take the, 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 the 60,000 regular riders of the GO system and think that you know this scope and this magnitude of system and, and all that it takes to make it function normally for a decade. So the list that you're looking at is going to be funded through PTIF, through PTIF 2, some of the things in here are funded with great partnership funding, all of it with expiration dates. And none of the conversation, as near as I can surmise, takes into account the fact that we cannot finish this conversation on the basis of some map that the Premier is promoting as places that he would like to build. That conversation should be spending the lion's share of its time figuring out how we will make these kinds of expenditures on a normal basis, on normal lines, every decade. Every single decade we'll need at least this at a minimum to keep going and to keep renewing what we already have. And so I'm not moving any motions, but I know that in, council, in the case of Councillor Cole's motion, I hope that we are at least talking to each other within our silos. And where Councillor Cole's motion asks that our executive or deputy city manager in charge of in infrastructure reports to the executive committee. I believe she need only look at the five and ten year plan that's being developed at the TTC and make sure that our two silos are demonstrating that in fact that's what should be having a, happening at the province. There ought to be integration between all the people involved at their ministry. They ought to have a regular seat at the table for the federal government on base systems and how those are maintained, and that we should be at that table in both respects, both our TTC people, the expertise of the system we own today, and the future plans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. 
Thank you, Speaker. I just want to refer to the administrative inquiry that the city manager was so gracious to answer. And the question was just how long has Metrolinx been working at Union Station and how far behind are they? And the answer was if they complete when they're supposed to, they'll have been nine years behind. If they complete when they're supposed to. And there's no guarantee that they will complete when they're supposed to. So somehow our transit system and our TTC is being shamed that they can't work fast enough, shamed they can't do things well enough. Well, here's the central spine, the central spine of the transit system for the 416 and the 905, nine years late and counting, nine years late and counting. So let's drop this, that somehow it's because the TTC doesn't know what they're doing. They are our experts on transit. They have the track record. And things may be late, but not with three different contractors over nine years. It's a pathetic case at Union Station, what's going on with Metrolink. So I'm not jumping, leaving people that I know can do something well and jumping over to people that have a track record at the main spine of nine years late and counting. That's the first thing I want to say. Secondly, there was just a story in the Toronto Star that outlined the terrible, terrible consequences. And Councillor Cole knows this all too well. The terrible consequences of the Eglinton Crosstown on the businesses on Eglinton. It is a wasteland. People are going belly up. They're losing their businesses. They're losing their leases. And it's as if, well, transit's happening. That's too bad. I would say that we've had different times with the TTC, but I know that the TTC is much more attuned and alert to the needs of local businesses than Metrolinx is proving to be on Eglinton. And the city, of course, we're waiting for a report on how local businesses will be treated with the relief line. There's something else with the Ontario line and the relief line. You all saw my little chart there. It's very clear. These are late to the party. Everything's going to be late. This thing cannot be done as quickly as they say. But there is a consequence of slowing down and stopping. And that's a woman coming to me when I was at an event north of the Danforth and crying. She's crying. What's going to happen to my property? Under the relief line as we know it, and that EA, her property is being taken. We could move and acquire that property and make her whole now. She'd like to move. Who's going to buy a house? Who's going to buy a house? that has a big bread mark on it. You may be expropriated for the relief line. You may be expropriated for the relief line. Not you. Currently, she is being expropriated for the relief line. But now this is throwing everybody into limbo with their property. And let me remind you that we're talking about billions of dollars in transit property. But when we are talking about people's homes, we're talking about their equity and their lives. The single most important thing that they have for their wealth. And to have everybody in limbo because of a flip of a coin or a change of a mind is just wrong. And I think we have to get that sorted out sooner rather than later because it's patently unfair that this is happening in this way to everybody who's seen currently what is going to happen to their property. And lastly, I'm very interested in where the storage facility will go, how, how many trains there will be, what happens uh, on the gauge, are these going to be used anywhere else. Just thinking about having, I remember when we were going to get the streetcars, and the first streetcar Bombardier brought, I think had the gauge at one, four, three, five millimeter. They said, oh, it's going to run on the same. The city said, no, no, our streetcars run on a different gauge. They run on a different gauge. You have to build those streetcars for our tracks. So somehow we're having a new line built where none of those trains can ever run on anything else. If I asked you what the stupidest idea you've ever heard, you'd have to put that in that category. It is the stupidest idea going to have a whole new set of cars that can't run on a subway line, running subway to subway, that can't run on our subway tracks. Silly, silly, no marks for that. 
Thank you. Councillor Perks. Members, it's happening exactly the way we knew it would. We knew three months ago when the Premier got up and made this announcement that there was no substance behind it. We knew that we would sit at that table and public employees from the City of Toronto and our, our planning staff and the TTC staff would gradually educate the Ministry of Transportation on how to run rail underground in an urban environment. And gradually they're learning a little bit more about it. We've advanced from uh, the back of a napkin to a PowerPoint and a little bit of correspondence. You know, some, every once in a while, some members of this council get up and admonish those of us who have a different view about what to do, that we're holding everything up, that we just keep, instead of making a decision and building transit, all we ever do is talk about transit. Well, here we are again, just talking about transit. And once again, a settled plan, a plan that we have spent tens of millions of dollars to advance, a plan we've consulted with Torontonians on, a plan our planning department has helped put together, the TTC has helped put together, that we have an environmental assessment on, that we are ready to, to go to the next phase on, is set aside because the Premier had a napkin. Ten years from now, another group of councillors will be standing around this, this council chamber and somebody will get up and say, you know, we never decide anything. All we ever do is talk about it. And they will be right because of what is going on right now. <coughs> Honestly, I mean, what's the next step? Does the Premier take us up to Canada's wonderland and say, no, actually, I want one of those? The, the foolishness, the complete waste of public money, public time, public attention, that is going into chasing this phantom plan when we have real problems. I hope you all listened carefully when Councillor Carroll was making her presentation. For years now, the leadership at the TTC has been saying we do not get the resources necessary to run the system we have, let alone the system we're going to need as people start taking transit more often as our city continues to develop. And yet, the wise heads, the cool heads continue to say, no, no, we should go to the table. We should indulge the Premier. We wouldn't want him to get mad at us. We wouldn't want governments to be in conflict with each other because that's not professional. Well, it wasn't professional when the medical officers of health of the city of Toronto, of, of every region in the province of Ontario got up and said, this is wrong. Or perhaps that was professional. Perhaps that's the very es essence of professionalism in a moment like this. Perhaps what we're called upon to do is to point out to Ontarians and to the people we represent here in Toronto that we are not going to throw away another decade chasing a foolish idea brought forward by someone who knows nothing about public transport transit and we're not going to put a fig leaf on it for him and do his homework for him and pretend it's real. You've heard me and others say before it's time to walk away from the table. I know that's not the mood of this council but we are making a deep strategic error. We are costing Torontonians another half decade or a decade on the transit system that they know is already inadequate. When the city manager for the city of Toronto describes the circumstance at our central transfer point as being a health and safety problem, and our staff are up helping the, the premier transfer his drawings from a napkin to a PowerPoint, instead of fixing what we know needs to be fixed, we are not doing our jobs. I put it to all of you. I put it to you. Next time we talk about this, be ready to walk away if you have not seen a real transit plan. I can tell you today you won't. I know you're not ready to make that decision yet. But if it's not here next time, walk away for the good of Toronto. Thank you. 
Councillor Robinson to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion I'd like to move. I don't have it in front of me, so um, I'll talk a little bit about it and uh, leave it at that. So we have a really impressive organization as part of the TTC. It's a, called ACAT. You may be familiar with them. If you're not, uh, please become familiar with them. They're the Advisory Committee on Accessibility um, and Transit, and uh, they're very informed. They're very, really experienced in how you make transit more accessible. And they're very concerned, obviously, about what's happening, and they'd like to have a voice in this process. So I'm moving these motions to ensure that happens and that there's meetings that uh, take place. Uh, the, both, both the chair and the vice chair have noted numerous times that they want to be at a table to discuss these issues. We've actually made great strides at the TTC on accessibility issues and uh, you know there's been some hiccups no doubt along the way but we have made great strides and we want to continue uh, down that path. So uh, if we're going to be expanding and building we want to get it right the first time and make sure that it's fully accessible. So they've asked for um, a discussion, a connection, meetings, whatever it takes to make sure that we uh, get accessibility right the first time on these new transit expansion projects. Uh, I, would, I think most of it's been said. I have very little to add uh, except to say that the bottom line is there are still more questions than answers. Um, as always, I've been concerned about the relief line, the delays with the relief line, and I do support uh, Councillor Bradford's motion. I've moved a similar motion in April. Um, and let's not forget the state of the SRT. I'm going to bring that up every time I speak, and the, it's in its dying days. Time is ticking, and what impacts does that have? So the Young Bloor station, at times we have to bypass. Uh, we're going to have more of that in the future because of overcrowding and issues there. So all these things are what I would call pressing mounting problems and any delays are not acceptable. And as I said earlier in my questions, uh, we actually had worked toward accelerating the relief line by two to three years. Uh, now we have heard that we're at one or two percent, the province is at one or two percent, whereas we are at 15 percent plus. Um, also, I would just like to, uh, as I finish summarize here, I would like to say I also uh, will be supporting Councillor Cole's motion. I think it's a great motion, and I hope you'll support it as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor... Um, I thought Councillor Pasternak had his name there. No, he took it off? Okay, is... <clears throat> Is that the last speaker? Okay. Yes, Councillor Peruzza. Uh, speaker, I, I just, um, I would like to introduce a group of students that's here today from the uh, Seneca at York Government Relations Program. Uh, these uh, uh, young folks uh, are... Um, are all well studied. Uh, they, m many of them have university degrees, but, but they are learning about um, uh, municipal government and they are here this day uh, to see municipal government in action. Uh, uh, they've been brought here by their leader and uh, instructor, uh, Andrew Pask. He's, uh, he's there and, and I know that, uh, and I know that, <laughs> And I know that many of you will know Andrew, and uh, you will know that Andrew is uh, giving them all the insights that they require uh, in ensuring that they learn all about municipal government. So I'd like to welcome to the chamber and invite them all down to my office after this, uh, when they get a chance uh, to go down there, and hopefully my staff can procure them a, a City of Toronto Council pin for all of you. Okay, Councillor Prutza, you would like to speak? Uh, I, I would, uh, uh, Speaker. I, I just got a, a couple of uh, things uh, to say on this. And, uh, uh, and I was sitting here musing on, uh, on the, our history around, uh, around the, the, the building of, of public transit and major, uh, and major uh, transit projects. Here's what I can say uh, today verifiably speaker, that I have no idea what 10, 15 years down the road is going to bring in terms of new project. 
And, and I don't think that any of us are in a position uh, to be able to say any different, Speaker, because if you look at our history, I remember 1988, the, Peterson, the then Peterson government made this grand announcement about public transit and transit expansion and building subways all over the place. And they basically, that basically never went anywhere. Uh, then I remember the Ray government. They came along and they said, well, you know what? We're going to build subways everywhere. Uh, and um, and uh, true, out of that announcement came a little subway called the Shepherd Subway, a couple of kilometers of subway from Young to, uh, to, um, uh, to, I believe, Town Mills, four stations, and a small little extension from Wilson to Shepherd of the Spadina, uh, of the Spadina line. And, but, but the significant thing to remember about all of that was this, that they started the Eglinton project, the Eglinton subway, and the next government came along and basically canceled it, buried that, and hundreds of millions of dollars of wasted money because that, that, that project was underway. So in, 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 in understanding that experience, uh, you know, uh, municipal councils then worked out a different kind of deal. It was called Transit City. You know, the, the, the sort of the LRT lines all across, uh, you know, the city of Toronto. Uh, had a deal from the then provincial government, 8.7, then reduced to $8.4 billion. That was going to do something uh, significant. Um, we got a couple of projects out of that. Uh, we got Eglinton, which is, you know, marshalling along. and and we're getting uh, the, uh, the Finch line. But the significant other thing that happened there was all of the wasted money. We had the Scarborough. So somebody came along and said subways, mentioned the word subways, and basically chucked a monkey wrench in the middle of it all, and hundreds of millions of dollars went up in smoke. We had started the Scarborough RT, got canceled. We had started Shepherd, the ex extension of Shepherd, got canceled. But what didn't get canceled was the tab, the money we spent on that. That became wasted money, hundreds of millions of dollars. Every time one of these things happens, you've got lots and lots of wasted money. We have spent 200 million on the one-stop Scarborough subway. We spent that. We wrote those checks, they were cashed. But now we're gonna go back to square one uh, with something else and basically we don't have a say in any of that. So uh, we need to revisit and quite frankly, if you look at the funding model for it, $660 million was committed by then Minister Flaherty, the late Minister Flaherty, to then Mayor, late Mayor Rob Ford who said, yeah, you want a one-stop Scarborough subway or a three-store, whatever that was, uh, we'll, we'll put some money into that. You've never seen anything in writing that says that the Trudeau Liberal government in Ottawa is ever going to honor a nickel of that money to, to Doug Ford as Premier of Ontario. Probably never happened. So what that means is that $200 million is basically... <coughs> Spent, burned, gone money, wasted money. Just simply because of how we do transit planning. It's not any one single authority. It's all driven by the provincial government. They've always driven it. We get to decide what we're going to do and we ask and then usually you have a government there that says, okay, fine, we'll help you do this one. But with the government that's there now, all we can do is go into a holding pattern. Thank you. And hopefully we won't spend any more money anywhere because we will be wasting it. Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. Okay, there are no more speakers. Last speaker, Mayor Tory. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Um, first of all, I, I would like to just make clear that where I'm coming from is I would much prefer we weren't involved in any of these discussions and that we were able to proceed ahead as much as there are some divisions in this room with respect to what our transit plan 
should consist of and what it shouldn't. It was our transit plan. It was approved by a substantial majority of the Council more than once, and I would prefer that uh, we would be able to proceed ahead with that. And that didn't contemplate, as a matter of interest, any particular change in ownership. It just proceeded, it, it contemplated us building the transit that was in the plan. Um, my main concern, uh, I'm concerned because, and I do support as well the uh, Council's clearly stated position that we would prefer the status quo with respect to the ownership of the system. Uh, my biggest concern at this stage is with respect to something that a number of members have just referred to, Speaker, which is the question of delay. Um, I don't think it is uh, conceivable that you could have the, uh, the extension of the Bloor Danforth subway in the, e in the east to Scarborough uh, done in anywhere near uh, the time frame that was contemplated after years of discussion and debating and revoting and, and two solid mandates given to, uh, to a, a, a mayor, myself, who ran explicitly on saying we were going to complete that project uh, and received an overwhelming mandate across the city. Um, secondly, and these are sort of disconnected points, but they're all connected. This, there's been a, the report deals with, and there's been m mention made here, and I've, I've heard uh, Councillor Perks often speak about uh, state of good repair. And that is, uh, you know, as crucial an issue facing the TTC and some of the comments that uh, Councillor Robinson made and others who had the long list of different things we have to pay for. And I can only say that to my knowledge, at the tables that we're meeting at with the province right now, that is a topic that is under active discussion, namely the need for them to make some contribution because no matter what arrangements are made, we can't possibly uh, deal with, nor were we ever contemplated to deal with based on property taxes, the entire uh, cost of, of, uh, of, of keeping up the uh, current transit system in a state of good repair, let alone the acquisition of new, uh, new vehicles and things like that. So I stand here today, Speaker, saying that I think we have to continue to move forward with this process, and I agree. We don't yet have specific answers to the 61 questions, but I did not hear uh, Ms. Cook or any other official say we were never going to get them. I heard them say that they're actively discussing those things within the broader context of state of good repair, within the broader context of the other proposals they've made, which I frankly don't have that much interest in, but, but we have to discuss them because they're the provincial government and they put them forward and we can't say, well, we're going to come to the table and discuss the things we want to discuss and not the things that you want to discuss. I guess there is a bit of encouragement in this report in that it does say on a couple of the things that are of interest to us and approved again by the City Council, namely the fixing of the Bloor uh, uh, Young Street interchange, um, that there's agreement on that and that, that that is on both priority lists and we're hopefully going to move forward with that and that's included in the list of funding uh, submitted to the federal government. And secondly is Smart Track. A Smart Track, we forget, does offer the opportunity soonest of all of these projects to have new transit stations open in the City of Toronto. It will provide not as much relief as the relief line will, but it will provide a degree of relief to the overstressed subway system uh, right now. Um, and I think that it is the best hope we have, and it is moving forward, and they have approved the stations and all the rest, and I think that gives us an opportunity to actually have those stations open uh, in relatively short order compared to all these other projects that we're talking about. I believe, and I want to finish on this note, I believe that it is better for us to be at this table including in light of the provisions of Bill 107. Bill 107 I find a very onerous piece of legislation. I believe it is unnecessarily onerous in terms of talking as it does about the ability they have to take away our subway paid for with in large measure with uh, Toronto taxpayers, property taxpayers money potentially without compensation. It's, a, it's an incredible uh, clause to have in a piece of legislation but we have a choice and this is a choice that's existed in front of this council all the way along. And fortunately, the majority of council have voted time after time after time, as I hope they will today, to heed the advice of our own city staff and to do what makes sense, which is to stay at the table with the province and continue to put our case forward as forcefully as we can and make sure that we do as well as we can. Unless somebody thinks that's just some political opinion that I have or that anybody else around here has, I will just point in conclusion, and this really is a reason to vote against uh, Councillor Matlow's motion to what our professional public servants have said to us. On page 8 of the report, the role of the city and the TTC, including the nature and governance of, the, of this relationship and engagement with the province, is a significant aspect of the work that is continuing. And that's work that's referred to in the discussions that Councillor Matlow would have us withdraw from. Uh, on page 10, continued engagement with the province remains critical 
remains critical to ensuring these objectives are met, providing City and TCTC staff the opportunity to discuss a wide range of ongoing topics, including conducting an assessment of the province's plans. And by that, I don't think it means just the plans for the relief line and so forth. It means all of their plans, including those that would be the subject of legislation. The legislation being passed is one thing. Actually doing something underneath that legislation is another. And then finally, page 16. City and TTC staff agree that it is imperative to remain engaged with the province to finalize an assessment of the Ontario line, influence the development of the projects, and advance the city's strategic objectives, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, to me, to walk away from this table and pass this motion that is suggested by Councillor Matlow would be the height of irresponsibility at a time when there is a lot at stake, when we are still much preferring our own current status quo with our transit plan to be implemented, but the only place I think to continue to make that case is there, otherwise we abdicate the field uh, to a government that has legislative power to do a lot of things that we don't like. And I think we've proven we can fight back and we've proven we can make progress and that's what I think we should continue to do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Matlow. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker. Mayor Tory, you, um you, uh, you argue against the motion that I've moved uh, based on uh, many things, but including you just cited staff's advice, staff recommendations. Would you not agree with me, though, that the decision that we have to make with respect to if we want to negotiate and how we want to negotiate is inherently political? In other words, it's strategic. It's um, whether or not we believe we have leverage if we don't, where do we want to get? And it's not just based on uh, staff advice in this context. It's not, it's not like we're relying on staff to say, how, how, do, how do you operate something? Madam Speaker, um, I, I will c concede the point that ultimately all decisions, I guess, pretty much, are left in the hands of this council. And so to that extent, all decisions have a degree of strategic uh, consideration about them as to whether we accept or don't accept the advice of public servants. But I will say to you, respectfully, through the Speaker, that when you see here that it isn't just the city staff but also the TTC, so these are the two groups of professionals that we rely on for advice <clears throat> with respect to how we are going to best achieve our objectives, because that's what they're advising us on here. Um, I will have to tell you, this is no dis disrespect to you or to anybody else who would agree with you on that motion, I will take their professional advice. They're sitting at the table. We're not, neither you nor me, uh, through you, Speaker. And they're sitting at the table. They are in a good position to assess how we're going to best try to advance our objectives to the greatest extent possible, knowing, and I say this with regret, that the deck is kind of stacked against us legislatively and otherwise. You so it what, is a know question of you you know, timing and leverage and all those things. And I've made it very clear that I support our transit plan. Even, you know, I know you and I would have a disagreement on parts of that, but I support our transit plan implemented on our terms with us owning it and them helping to pay for it, including paying for state of good repair. I so, agree. yeah, I concede we have the ultimate decision here, but I'm taking their advice because I think it's the right advice. I, 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 I do hear you, and, I, and by the way, I, I understand why you would. I'm submitting to you to consider, in the, in the form of a question, of course, but I, I just I ask you to consider. Um, while staff may be in a position where they are hearing specific detailed um, uh, whether it be requests or, uh, or just information that they believe they have the experience and knowledge to partake in that conversation and they believe that they can move that conversation perhaps towards an end that we want to get to. Strategically and politically, they may be in a situation where, even without them knowing, the province is, from a merely political and strategic place, trying to accrue information from them to be able to uh, meet their political goal, which is to take over our system in a way uh, that, that, yeah, they want to do and they want to get to, but they need our help to do. And therefore, we as, as the governors of this body, we as the elected representatives, sometimes we need to take staff advice, certainly when it comes to following the facts and being guided by evidence, but there are other times like this one where it's not so much um, a decision between technologies or Counselor, projections or lines. Question? Well, it, it, question? in fairness, wow. it, it, it's, ask the question. I, I am. And I, I think Mayor Tory is following what, I, what I'm saying. No, but you have to ask the question. I'm, I'm happy to I, answer I, it. I am. I, no, we're, we're, yeah. I would say this. Uh, I don't think with this group at Queen's Park that you could say anything's impossible. However, 
Um, it is my judgment as one of those with you and with the other 24 of us here uh, that it, we are better at this point in time, uh, especially given the impulses of this government, which might be if we walked away from the table to say, fine then, we will do exactly what you fear most, which is them just saying we're going to take Bill 107 and we're going to do it in its worst possible you know, connotation and take it over without compensation and, and we will then be left with no ability to exercise any option. I believe we are better off at the table and I would point out respectfully, uh, Speaker, uh, to the member through you that, that the very people who would have to carry out the instructions are the people we're sitting at the table with. They're not politicians, but they are the people who if they had, so they would be sitting there in such mm -hmm. extraordinary bad faith as non-politicians having discussions with us and from everything I've heard from all of our people, and Mr. Lindsay, for example, is a person who is sitting at the table in good faith, having good faith discussions, and I think would be horrified at any notion that he'd be told that he should just, that, that really what this is is a sort of a Trojan horse mission, I think, as you described it earlier, where they're just trying to suck information from us and then move to do something unilaterally. I think they're, everybody's trying in good faith. I've also said, and, and I'll conclude on this note, Madam Speaker, that if we get to the stage, and it's not my judgment alone, it's our collective judgment, where we think we're being taken advantage of or where they're acting in bad faith, I'll be the first one, or among the first to say, let's abandon this table and, and, and uh, enjoying the fight in a different way. But for the moment, this actually appears to be maybe the only table that's actually been set up where I think there actually are legitimate discussions going on as opposed to or contrasted with the council decision, which was entirely unilateral. The budget attempt, which was entire, entirely unilateral, now we maybe do have a table, or the planning decisions, which were entirely unilateral. So I, I just still place faith in the table. Okay, thank you. That was your last question. Thank you. Okay, we can vote. Okay, we're going to vote on the motions in numeric order. Motion one by Councillor Matlow, recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. The whole thing, the whole thing. We're already in the middle of a vote. The motion I, does not carry. The vote is 7 to 19. Okay, motion two by Councillor Cole. All in favor? You want a recorded vote? Recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. And the motion carries 25 to 1. Okay, motion 3 by Councillor Bradford. There's been a request to vote on it separately. So part 1, recorded vote. Councillor Madlow, please. Councillor Karajanis. Councillor Pastor. Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Carroll, and Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Cressy, please. Councillor Carroll, please. Part one of the motion carries 22 to 4. Part two.
Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Fillion, and Councillor Pasternak, please. Thank you. Part two of the motion carries 20 to six. Okay, motion four by Councillor um, Robinson. Recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, please. Part four, or sorry, motion four carries unanimously uh, 26 in favor. Okay, item as amended, recorded vote. Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Karajanis, on the item is amended. Councillor Cole, please, and Councillor Perutza. Mayor Tory, please. The item is amended, carries 25 to 1. Okay, our next item is on page 3. EX 6.6, uh, Councillor Carroll. Effective collaboration with Ontario municipalities. You held the item down. Do we have questions? Okay, please put your name up, request to question staff. Councillor Carroll. Yes. Councillor Carroll, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I I wanted to uh, ask questions that might clear up some of the confusion that was happening at Executive. There was some confusion about what I had said in my remarks. So my question, um, there is there is still the MOU that was the original reason that we uh, we departed our membership from from the Association of Municipalities, is there not? Um, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, are, you, are you referring to the MO, the uh, AMO MOU? Yes. Uh, I believe it's still in existence, yes. Yes. So it's still there. But in fact, um, is it not also true that the, the literal nature of that MOU, sorry, I, I just, I wish Councillor Thompson was listening because he was one of the people who had that confusion. Is it not also true? that the, the literal interpretation we had on that MOU has since actually uh, uh, ceased to be. Individual municipalities, when they have individual concerns, there's a table both at the, uh, the events for individual municipalities to meet with individual ministers and throughout the course of the year. If they have an issue and they need to go to Queen's Park, say Dryden, Ontario has an issue on its rail line and it's only an issue for Dryden. They are able to go to the provincial government. They are able to deal with their unique needs, minister to mayor. Is that not the case? What I understand uh, through the speaker, what I understand of the AMO MOU is that it does represent, um, and it's specifically under the terms and conditions of the MOU, it sets out the, the subject matters uh, on which AMO will endeavor to articulate a united uh, municipal position. I would could, could right. comment on that specific municipality. Right, and so there are just as we have at the uh, at FCM, we have an agreement that we might decide uh, lobbying pillars, for usually four pillars, sometimes three, sometimes five, and we all work together on them. We've we've been very successful doing that in the when we did the gas tax, when we do our housing advocacy, et cetera. But when you have to go and, for instance, we, we are the, the, uh, the largest municipality in the municipality with the subway. So when something is unique to us, there is still an ability 
to go minister to minister or premier to mayor? Through the speaker, councillor, are you referring to our ability or uh, our ability, or, or uh, as is demonstrated at every AGM that I've attended, the ability of any municipality in Ontario? Despite that MOU that we lobby together on some issues, if a municipality needs a voice on an issue that is meaningful to them and perhaps no other, they have an ability to deal with it in that fashion. Uh, through the speaker. Uh, I would say yes, although with AMO, they have, for example, on the gas tax, on housing, on refugees, on right. certain items, they have, uh, do are representing the collective voice on certain big issues. Right, right. They lobby collectively on those, because those, of course, are, are issues that all municipalities share. Yes. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Just a question of staff. I'm just wondering, uh, has AMO been on record uh, in responding to the unilateral cuts to boards of health across the province? Have they taken a position on that? Uh, through the speaker, uh, I am not familiar with Amos' position on the public health cuts. Uh, I don't know if someone here from public health is able to comment on that. Is there anyone in public health here? Uh, I uh, don't think this is uh, Councillor Cole. Well, it's about Amo, right, and their relationship with Amo. Well, but that's that's not before. Well, we're possibly going to be a member again, so this is very important to find out what AMO is about. Anyways, so I, the second question I have, uh, has AMO taken a position on uh, Bill 108, the dramatic changes in uh, the powers of local governments over local planning? Have they taken a position on that? I don't think anybody has the answer. Great night. Okay, city manager, I don't know. planning, legal. <sighs> okay. If I could repeat the question again, yeah. just trying to find out uh, basically where AMO is at and their effectiveness. And uh, so the question I had, I know you've reached out uh, our chief planner to uh, many municipalities about the changes in Bill 108 and the dramatic. Uh, lessening of uh, local planning powers, did AMO take a position uh, publicly on Bill 108? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to look into it uh, through the speaker. I don't have that information in front of me. Have you ever had any communication from them? I, I don't have it in front of me. I, I've had communication with individual municipalities, and they certainly uh, have reported to their respective councils with the same level of... Uh, concern that we've expressed to this council. But so AMO, that would include Mississauga, yeah. uh, Durham, Hamilton. It's a long list. So I wouldn't be surprised if AMO took a position. I'm just saying I don't have it in front of me. But you know, you've done the outreach. Has AMO reached out to you or asked for any input? Okay, just a sec. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Cole is asking I questions. No, well, I, thank you for apologizing. Well, Again, uh, AMO may have been involved with the city manager's office, but I have been involved with specific municipalities, not with AMO. Okay. So if I can, through the speaker, uh, they weren't in direct contact with me or indirect contact even in terms of what Bill 108. So you haven't heard from AMO about Bill 108 or the public health cuts? Uh, I can't confirm on the public health cuts or the uh, other cuts that we had uh, uh, had raised with the province, so but that uh, but I could I stand to be corrected if if someone else was aware of anything AMO did officially. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What what's what's happening here? Okay, come on. It's not me. No. Ask 
Is it? Is everyone done? Is everyone finished? Councillor. Council. Okay, please. Can I have some order, please? Councillor Ainsley, questions. Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Speaker, to the City Manager. Um, so the, we have certain powers that we were given under the City of Toronto Act. Um, if we re reapplied or got a full membership in uh, AMO, would, it, would any of those powers that we've been given under the City of Toronto Act be threatened or undermined? Uh, through the Speaker, short answer is no. Short answer is no. Okay. And, you know, I'm familiar with AMO and a lot of the work that they do. Um, I would think that it would be beneficial to have the City of Toronto at that table in some shape or manner. I can think of Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Ontario Good Roads Association, where there's a number of issues that happen across the province, where having those organizations at the table benefits the small, smaller municipalities, and I would think that AMO would be the same. Uh, through the speaker, uh, I understand that logic, and I don't disagree with it. Um, what I can tell you is that it's not as if we don't engage with AMO on other matters. We have, I know, in the past. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I know uh, uh, our deputy city manager, Tracy, uh, did uh, discuss with them uh, issues related to um, Uber. Uh, I believe we were in contact with AMO as it related to the legalization of uh, marijuana. So it's not like we don't engage with them uh, today. So this would just be an, uh, an attempt for us to be able to see if there isn't an opportunity for a more formal uh, relationship, respecting the fact that we're not going to give up any powers, any authorities that we already have. Right. So there are a number of synergies. There's been items we've worked on before. This is simply looking at how we can enhance that process or the relationship without necessarily rejoining AMO fully. Uh, that's, I think that's the spirit of this uh, direction that uh, we're recommending and, uh, and we'll obviously report back if there's any downside, we'll be clear on that. Uh, but uh, you know, where the, you know, the provincial government obviously has a relationship with AMO and, and is in direct conversation with AMO, uh, I can understand the logic of wanting to be part of that conversation to gather more information doesn't preclude us from having our own direct uh, you know, conversations with them, but just another avenue uh, to partner potentially with other municipalities. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I understand from the report that uh, the charge to the City of Toronto for joining AMO is $131,000. Is that, is that on an annual basis? Uh, through the speaker, yes it is. And would we be, because of the calculation of, of how that fee is derived at, would we be the largest contributor? Yes, we would be. Now, I'm not overly familiar with AMO, but do they have various subcommittees or some kind of plenary where there's votes or consensus building or how, how is it done from a Just from like a decision yes, making yeah. pen? Uh, so in terms of the structure they do have a board they also have a number of caucuses they have an annual general meeting that is occurring now it, it happens every year in August uh, and then the membership um, uh, of AMO fills those positions so as the biggest if we joined if as the biggest payer would we get would the, would the representation on its various committees or board or decision-making bodies be commensurate with the same logic that they're using to uh, levy this fee, which is per capita? Uh, through the speaker, if we were a full member, we would be able to then take part in the uh, committees, potentially the board. Uh, if there was a, a different type of arrangement, it, would be, it remains to be seen what our role would be. So it was the biggest participant, the biggest payer, and the biggest municipality. We the biggest would, we, would we get uh, a proportional or higher proportion of votes on their various decision-making bodies? We have not been, through the speaker, we have not been members since 2004. Uh, I don't know, we don't know what, um, what the, I guess, proportion of, of votes we would have. Okay. All right. Um, 
Is there a reason why we left in the first place, why we haven't been a member for so long? Yes. Uh, through the speaker, as I understand, uh, at that time in 2004, uh, the city wanted to pursue its own direct government-to-government -government relationships uh, and also to enable it to have its own intergovernmental agreements and have its own seat at the table. So at that time, it was felt that the best interests of the City of Toronto were, were served by us you working directly with our, our provincial counterparts? Uh, through the speaker, yes. And has, has that changed in any way? Uh, through the speaker, since 2004, we've made great strides in that respect. We now have the City of Toronto Act, which is uh, other Ontario municipalities have the Municipal Act. Uh, so just one sec. Uh, Councillor Cressy, I could hear you from here. Okay, go ahead. Also, under the City of Toronto Act, we have the uh, Toronto-Ontario Consultation Agreement, which is, is akin to the MOU that AMO has with the province. So, could we conclude that we've done just fine on our own without being members? Uh, through the speaker, I think we've, ach if we've achieved the goals we're, and we are working on achieving those goals that we set out in 2004. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, questions? Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, through you. Um, David Miller was the uh, mayor of Toronto at the time when we went through a process to remove ourselves from AMO. Is that correct? Uh, through the speaker, yes. Right. And do you recall at that time, uh, part of the issue for us was about who spoke for Toronto and whether or not Toronto actually had the ability to speak for itself? That was part of the issue at that time? Uh, through the speaker, I was not on this file at that time, but I understand that to be the issue. I'm sorry? Uh, I was not on the file at, this time, at that time, but I understand that to be the issue from the right. report, previous reports. All right, I recall Rod, Roger Anderson and others coming in convincing us that we need to be part of AMO. Do you recall that? Were you, you weren't here at that time, you said? Okay, that's I great. Was I was here. Um, to the city manager, Mr. City Manager, um, we have a relationship with AMO now. It's, uh, can you define what that is? Is it a loose relationship? It's a relationship where we're able to collaborate and work with without being uh, a registered member, spending a hundred and, what's 130,000 a year? Correct. Is that correct? So through the speaker, yes, we do have that kind of relationship. So they benefit from our knowledge. Right. Uh, we benefit from uh, the knowledge of those that uh, we engage with. So, but that, that is an existing relationship. So what then is the real purpose? Is it the real purpose so that AMO can have their conference here in Toronto? Uh, what's the purpose of us actually being involved with AMO other than the relationship we have right now? What's the real benefit to us? I, I don't, uh, through the speaker, I, I don't see it as, a, uh, you know, where a meeting takes place. It's, it's an entity that represents municipalities in Ontario, which we are obviously a s significant uh, part of that, uh, that, that political fabric. And, uh, it does uh, create another avenue for us to uh, uh, more than just uh, on an issue by issue basis to be able to uh, throw our, our support and our ability to move uh, items that are important to municipalities to move them forward in concert with them in partnerships. Uh, and I think that's what AMO offers is that ability for municipalities to work together to have a common voice uh, but at the same time for us to not lose our ability to have our unique voice when we need it. Right, but that, that common voice relationship, we have that now. Is that what you're saying or we don't have that? Well, I think when AMO puts a motion forward to the provincial government is right. without the City of Toronto. Right, but do we really need to be part of AMO's motion to the City of, uh, to the province of Ontario? I would argue through the speaker, it certainly benefits AMO to have us as a right. member. Um, uh, I think though there are going to be those moments where the voices of others uh, that AMO will speak for, uh, will we'll support directions that we want. Uh, so uh, I do think it is a, uh, uh, it does swing both ways. But notwithstanding that fact, uh, we don't lose the authority to express ourselves either to support AMO or to be perhaps in the opposite uh, position to a matter that AMO or a position that AMO may have, is that correct? Through the speaker, you're right. I think there's, we always have the ability to state our views independently and then uh, concur where we want to concur with AMO uh, without necessarily having to join them. Uh, 
but again, you know, there is a, I think increasingly what's going to happen with municipalities in this province is right. that uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to have to find ways to work together right. uh, formally and informally. Right. And I see this as uh, notwithstanding the things that we don't want to lose. Uh, this is simply me being given an opportunity to go talk with the leadership at EMO to see whether or not they can meet our needs without us sacrificing any of our abilities. Right, you've been giving that authority now. But I mean, we have a smaller body, smaller number of council and so on. Uh, who would take on this additional role of responsibility? Is that your staff yep. and uh, the resources? So over the next 10 years, we'll be paying a million dollars to EMO, for example, because or a million plus? I don't see the benefit. Then through the speaker, I, I can understand how you might vote. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very good one. <laughs> Councillor, okay, that was it for the questions. To speak, Councillor Carroll, you held the item down. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the, um, the, the questions that were asked earlier uh, about uh, uh, Bill 108, about public health, uh, even Bill 107, getting Ontario moving, of course, AMO took positions. Just as when uh, something uh, affects every municipality in Canada, FCM speaks, and including us as their member, uh, they, they also speak uh, uh, when something affects every municipality and provinces. What was misunderstood, I took from the remarks after I spoke at executive, because I spoke first as a non-member, from the members that they had completely misheard what I said. They th thought that I was advocating for us to give up our voice quite vehemently, and I thought, where was, did I speak in a parallel universe? What I said was, and I'm going to say it again, what I understand from talking to, to, to member municipalities, and I've been lobbied by them every year because I'm one of the few councillors left in this chamber who was there the day we quit, was standing in the Weston in Ottawa when we quit. Councillor Howard Moscow walked out a door and said, hey, come here, it's going to get exciting. I quit us. And it was over the MOU, which is why I asked the questions. At that time, Mayor Ann Mulvale from, uh, from Oakville was adamant that we will sign this MOU and anything you wish to say, anything you wish to say to Queen's Park, you have to say it through us. So, of course, on your behalf, Councillor Moscow said absolutely not. And when he said, I'm going to resign us, the mayor, yes, Mayor Miller, backed him up. Because if you, if you send a councillor and they're put in that circumstance, it's a difficult situation for a mayor to be in. You kind of have to back that councillor up unless he kind of jumped the shark at the moment that he quit. Councillor Moscow delivered that resignation for good reason. But here's what happened. Within a year, Municipalities all over Ontario were realizing this isn't workable for us either. There are times when this is just about us in our municipality. It's not about every municipality of Ontario. And so just like FCM, just like FCM, that we enjoy a relationship with so well and earn from it and benefit from it, just like FCM, what they have is an exercise they go through every year to decide what they are going to advocate for and lobby on together. And they decide uh, what's up to you, what's an individual thing. They decide it when they go through plenaries. People move uh, resolutions that are really just about them, and they say, you know, it's not really in order here. Advocate on your own. Ministers uh, of the Crown come to the functions and, and set up sessions where you can come one by one and have your one-on-one -on -one conversations for remote municipalities who aren't going to go up the hill because it's just blocks away. They have those moments. They also have webinars and seminars, and the Premier and the ministers, whomever is in office at the time, have, on, have, have ongoing webinars and policy conferences and really guide the conversation there. And I mean really guide it. And the fact that we are not there means that not just in size, we're without peer because of our size, but we're really without peer in Ontario. When they start to have a conversation with Minister Steve Clark and, and he's selling them snake oil called Bill 108 and we're not in the room, we're not asking questions. We're not in that room. 
Are you serious? You don't want to be in that room? It's possible that the cost-sharing of public health conversation started there in some room, and we weren't there to say, wait a second, wait a second, we're the city where SARS started. Hold on a second. We're not in that room. For very little money, we could just be in that room to be a part of that conversation. We're not going to get to run it, just like FCM. They'll never let us run it. They'll probably never let us have a president. But we ought to be part of that conversation. When they're in that room selling snake oil, we ought to be there to say, hold up, could I just ask a few questions? And the other municipalities in Ontario will hear our question and think, hey, wait, now I have a question. Hold up, Minister Clark. That's what I'm asking that we begin to do. I think membership would be a less insulting way to do it. I honestly do. I think that's where they start to say, who does Toronto think it is? When we say we want all the perks but no membership, I think we should honestly join and be a part of the conversation. Thank you. Councillor Matt Lowe to speak. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, I, I stand in support of uh, Councillor Carroll's uh, initiative. And while Councillor Carroll just said that she would support membership, I just want to make it very clear what I read in the motion. It's just as important as what it isn't as what it is. What it isn't is a formal request at this point to become a member. What it is is allowing uh, our city manager to meaningfully explore what kind of formal relationship we could have. And that's, a, I think, a, you know, at, at the very least, a very reasonable request, given the number of different bills, the number of different announcements that are being made, sometimes daily or hourly, that affect not only Toronto, but the entire region and the entire province. Um, you know, with respect to whose voice is, uh, is spoken for, who, who speaks for Toronto, just because we would have some sort of, whether it be membership or some sort of formal association, doesn't mean that when we have something to say about Toronto and for Toronto, that we can't speak for Toronto. We don't need to be led by anybody. We can lead, in fact. And sometimes we can speak on our own without having any concert with anyone else. With respect to fees, we haven't even... Mr. Murray hasn't even had a discussion with them, never mind discussing fees. So he would come back to us, and if there's a fee, we can debate that. But, you know, it's jumping the gun to even suggest that we're agreeing to pay anything. And if we do want to pay anything, perhaps it would be a good investment. But that's the next debate, and that's the next discussion based on what, uh, what the city manager would recommend coming out of those discussions. Nonetheless, you know well, and we've all voted in support of this, that I support moving forward not only with the powers that we have under the City of Toronto Act, I believe that we should have a city charter. I believe that Toronto is unique, and I believe Toronto is exceptional. We, and, uh, we are, and, and we, you know, we, are, we are Canada's largest city. We are Ontario's largest city. But we are also Ontario's capital city, and we are a member of the Ontario family. And while we need powers and tools Yali. and the abilities that meet our needs as a global city within Ontario and within Canada. We also need friends, and they need us. Uh, during Bill 108, not only did AMO uh, speak up uh, publicly about it, they said it's negative, but I found such comfort and support um, working in an ad hoc way with uh, members of uh, council throughout our region uh, who share our views, who share our opinions, and are willing to take a stand for good community planning. Um, we need them. And in fact, I would submit to you that at a time where we have a premier and a government that has a uh, political ideology that may reflect ridings in areas of Ontario, that their voices may speak louder than ours, given Toronto's relationship with uh, Premier Ford. We need them perhaps sometimes even more than they need us. And then sometimes our voice will be there to support their needs if they feel under attack or when we need to speak in unison. There is nothing to fear by building relationships and finding some formal way to cooperate with our fellow Ontario municipalities. Uh, there are times when we need them to speak up for us, and I've seen that already happen, and I'd like to be there for them too. Last point I'll make, um, I've had experiences not so much in Canada, but in the United States where I've been invited to meetings with other municipalities, members of council, and I see it as like, almost like a, a candy shop of experiences, almost like a, a kid going and seeing sort of a college you know, course program and, and, and learning about things and best practices and skill sharing. And the experiences that we can have 
whether it be at uh, FCM in Canada or the National League of Cities in the United States or here within Ontario, can be incredibly beneficial for this city. Uh, we're doing things that they can learn from, they're doing things that we can learn from, and we can only benefit from having that relationship. So I just want to thank Councillor Carroll for bringing this initiative to our attention. Uh, and at the very least, and this is, uh, I'm just going to reiterate, this, the ask today is to allow Mr. Murray to go and talk with them and have a conversation about where we could go together, and then he'll come back to us, and then we can decide whether or not we think that's reasonable. So I hope you'll support uh, what Councillor Carroll is asking us today. Uh, thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm not in support of going down this road. Uh, I've been here before in my former time at Council. I was a member of AMO. And believe me, it's such a hostile environment there that, you know, you are Toronto, you know everything. It was really difficult. I mean, the only person that kept me involved with that was Councillor Moscow, who would spend so much time fighting for Toronto. Uh, I mean, he was a trooper, and he would be constantly attacked and told, you know, what do you know? You're from Toronto. But Howard, in his own inimitable way, stood up for our city by himself. And that's why eventually he said, I've had enough, when they did that to him uh, back at the time of Mayor Miller. And, and uh, you know, uh, I just look at our just recent experience. You know, if it hadn't have been for the City of Toronto, Councillor Joe Cressy's leadership and Mayor Tory's leadership on the public health cuts, we saved the whole province. You know, they organized the counterattack against that cut. It wasn't AMO. They were, yeah, did they issue a statement? I don't know, maybe they did. I just certainly didn't see them or hear them stand up and say this is wrong and you can't reduce the number of public health boards from 35 to 10 without consultation and uh, cut uh, the 170-odd uh, million dollars uh, from public health without any consultation. It wasn't AMO. And so if we think magically we're going to be part of AMO and AMO is going to uh, have this great relationship with us and we're going to be able to fight together, you're dreaming in technicolor. What we need is a continued action as a City of Toronto to stand up for the city like we've been doing on 108, we've been doing on the public health cuts. And uh, being part of AMO is, again, a very, let's say, undemocratic organization in that we represent, as a councillor, what do you represent? 120,000 people? So what do we get? One vote for all of us? We should have maybe 25 votes. At Would they give us that? No, you'll be the same as Kenora or uh, Brockville, uh, you know, or uh, Sioux Lookout. So, uh, yeah, so therefore there's no appreciation of the fact We've got 2.7 million people here. So maybe they should give a vote on AMO to each one of us, based on 2.9 million, uh, Councilor Prusa said. So, Leave. you know, it is not, I think, to our advantage in representing our citizens to be part of an organization that traditionally has not really appreciated the challenges we have in Toronto and I've had in Toronto, I know they've been very dismissive of what we've gone through over the years. Maybe they've changed recently, but as I said, in the recent attacks through 108, I didn't see them or hear them very loud. They were whispering maybe to certain councillors, but they weren't speaking up and standing up for what was happening in 108. The same with the public health cuts. Where was AMO on that? I certainly didn't hear them or see them. Maybe I missed it. Maybe they talked to individual councillors. Certainly, we didn't, uh, I didn't hear from them or see them visibly stand up and be counted when there was a time to be counted. So I, I don't support going down this path. We don't need to be part of AMO. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I guess of the schools of thought that are in the chamber today, I would lean more towards uh, Councillor Cole. I just wanted to uh, remind um, councillors of various uh, situations over the last few years in which the municipalities outside of Toronto uh, were no friend of ours. Uh, you may recall uh, during the uh, casino debate, 
where we had negotiated a $100 million hosting fee for a major casino in the city of Toronto. Well, once the mayors of Ottawa, Niagara, Windsor caught wind of that, they went berserk, saying they were mistreated, they were, they were, uh, they were marginalized, and they went to the Premier, and then we, the Premier had to make a statement in which our $100 million hosting fee then got cut to $50 million, and of course the whole thing Sorry, 20, I stand corrected, 20 from there. I should also remind councillors that when this uh, council supported road tolls on the Don Valley Parkway yes. and the Gardener to pay for transit, and, and, and much of that money would have gone to extending the line up, to, up into Vaughan, the 905 went into a lather about Toronto and, and, uh, and our, our nerve of, of charging charging this money. It was starting off as a $2 road toll. Well, I can tell you, I've driven to New York enough times to know that to get over the George Washington Bridge is 15 U.S. And to get over a smaller bridge, other the Robert Kennedy Bridge, before that, is 850. And here, the 905, money dedicated to transit to bring them into Toronto easier, was fought. You may also call, recall uh, more recently when, when we were looking at the Eglinton West LRT that was going to go out to Pearson. There was a staff report which recommended that the city of Mississauga contribute about $600 million to that project. Well, the firestorm uh, that, that happened in Mississauga City Council, how dare Toronto assume we're going to pay, we're never going to pay for this, how dare they try and uh, dictate to us uh, what's going on. Need I go into the TRCA where the city of Toronto is the major contributor? Yet we get a very little voice uh, at that body. We don't get the, uh, we don't get the uh, positions of, of authority, the chair and so forth. Uh, and we have in the past. I'm not going to say we never got it. But basically we're the biggest contributor and we get the least out of it. Go Transit. We are the biggest contributor to the operational cost of Go Transit. Yet the residents of Toronto rarely take Go Transit because it's really for regional transit of people coming in and out of, of Toronto. I think this is going to be another organization in which we pay the lion's share, we pay big fees, we commit the time, the valued time of a shrunken council and that at the end of the day we'll get, uh, we'll get uh, very little out of it. Uh, that being said, the motions before us do not uh, look us to vote formally to, to join the organization. We're all only directing the city manager to come back and look at a more formal participation and to continue to look for opportunities where the City of Toronto can, ten, can work uh, with AMO to, um, to collaborate on very issues. I see no harm in that. I, I am concerned about going down the road where we could result in membership, but I'm trusting that the City Manager will come back with a more formal uh, recommendation uh, on whether we join or not, and we are not making that decision today. Talking is good. Joining is bad. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I've, I've learned a, quite a number of things in this debate. Um, probably most importantly, that if we do join AMO, I'm not sending Councillor Cole. But <laughs> the reason why we wouldn't send Councillor Cole, I think, is kind of important. Councillor Cole talked about how the City of Toronto stopped these cuts from province wide. Complete revisionism. Complete revisionism. Ask Councillor Cressy. When we got the news about the cuts to public health, who were the first calls to? It was to Alpha, the Association of Public Health Units. What did the medical officer of health do? She called all the other medical officers of health. When we were faced with the larger budget cut problem and we were faced similarly with the attack on our planning, what tipped the balance? Well, some of it is all the doors that the mayor knocked on, but I think that actually having LUMCO, the large urban mayor's caucus of Ontario, step forward was actually the straw that broke the camel's back. We're in an era where the hierarchical relationships between government no longer work to our benefit. In fact, they work quite to our disbenefit. If you, if you watch the trend over a generation, the infrastructure spending, which used to be primarily federal and provincial, is now primarily on the property tax base. The interests of municipalities have been swamped, not just by this most recent government, 
but by a series of federal and provincial governments downloading costs and programs and responsibilities and duties onto municipalities. Where we have been successful in these last six months are not those vertical relationships, but the horizontal relationships. It's been our ability to speak to other medical officers of health or other chief planners or other large urban mayors that has given us the strength, resources, and political effectiveness across the province to stop a government in its tracks, a provincial government. And why we would turn down another one of those horizontal relationships that allows us to push back against the decades-long trend of making local governments responsible for things that used to belong to those governments that have broader taxation powers is beyond me. And until we have access to those broader taxation powers, we can't carry the load of responsibilities that they're dumping on us. And we're not going to get either of those solutions, broader taxation powers or uh, uploading instead of downloading, without those horizontal relationships across municipalities all over Ontario. It is absolutely essential that if we plan to be able to meet our ambitious targets for public transit or have real control over planning or even talk about being a charter city, we're going to have to behave differently than we have in the last bunch of years. Councillor Pasternak gave a very compelling and persuasive list of a number of times in the last five or ten years where other municipalities have not had our back. Well, small surprise, we haven't been talking to them. We haven't been building the relationships. We haven't been building the case. We haven't been pointing out that when we win the fight about the relationship between the provincial and municipal governments in the province of Ontario, everybody benefits. Frankly, Councillor Pasternak's speech was the best evidence that's been given today as to why we should open ourselves to this conversation, sit down and figure out a working relationship where we solve our common problem, which is that as federal and provincial governments pursue their endless raft of tax cuts matched by downloading onto municipalities the services that Torontonians and people in, Halif in Halifax or in Ottawa or in Wawa or in Kitchener or Waterloo or Hamilton or any other municipality are facing the same pressures. Let's get together with them and push back together. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> As a first-term uh, counselor on this council, I've heard a lot of uh, history about this whole thing, and, uh, and I just wanted to share with you uh, uh, my personal story about, uh, from my previous life, I belong to an association that have a tripartite agreement that if you belong to the uh, city uh, the association, then you automatically have to join the provincial arm, and then you automatically have to be in the federal arm, which is uh, represented uh, federally. And I... Um, I don't think uh, that uh, will be a good idea to, to uh, there's not in the value for the money, that especially I heard that is $131,000, is not really worth being sitting there because, you know, a lot of times uh, the issues f uh, of Toronto is different from the issues of different parts uh, of, the, uh, of the province. And especially, uh, I tend to agree, my colleagues here, Pas uh, Councillor Pasternet and Councillor Cole, saying that uh, what they what have they done? What have AMO done uh, on Bill 108 or the provincial health cut? And I think uh, we've done our own job, and I don't think there's really value for the money, especially at a time that we have to have efficiencies in the, in, in our budget. I don't think it's money well spent. So I would be uh, I think I would support the staff recommendation by working together with AMO, especially keeping up with a good relationship with them and helping each other, but I would uh, not be supporting uh, joining AMO. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Peruzza, you're on.
Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm just uh, finishing up on some uh, important stuff. Uh, I guess to some degree I could be of two minds on, uh, on this issue. I, I like uh, Councillor Cole's position, for example. I, I sat here and I listened to that and I thought, oh, wow, yeah, that, that's, that rings true. Uh, but I, I remember, I, I remember uh, the, uh, the mayor of, uh, of um, what was that city again? Oakville. Oakville, that's right. Uh, what was her name again? Ann Mulville, that was her name. Yes, uh, yes. I, 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 I remember. I, I remember. I remember my time at the, at the province. We were in the middle of a recession, and, uh, and uh, they were having all kinds of issues. Uh, you know, we need to uh, eliminate red tape. We need to get development going. We need to create jobs. We need better transit integration. Uh, you know, across the region and the rest of it. And the minister at the of the time at the time set up this. Uh, 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 this group uh, at the behest of Mayor Mulvale from Oakville and um, it was a, it was a mayor sort of a, 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 a kind of GTA mayor's round table on you know and having conversations on current issues of the day and uh, and I got asked by the minister to chair uh, that particular august body and uh, and I have to tell you, I, I you know, I'm traveling up to Wawa, as uh, Councillor Cole, as I'm sure, has done a number of occasions, or or traveling up to Armstrong, Ontario, basic a crossroads at the at, at the sort of at the at the end of the roads, as it were, on the uh, on the rail line that uh, Sir John A. Macdonald built, uh, that spans uh, coast to coast Rusa, of can this you, country. Can you uh, look this way when you speak? Uh, I'm. Do, do, do you, do you want, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I can't hear you. Oh, you're the, back. The, the, the point. The, you're not missing right. anything. You don't, yeah. You're not missing yeah. anything. The, 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 the point is this. Uh, the point is this, Speaker. Uh, uh, as I reminisce, um, <laughs> the the point is that it's true that outside of Toronto, people love uh, to hate Toronto. They do. I can't imagine them watching that parade yesterday and Nathan Phillips Square full of people and, and, and basically reaffirming why it is that they live in Wawa, right? And, and, uh, and, and, and all those people down there, look at them all, right? Like, you can't imagine <laughs> uh, for sure. But, but the important thing is that you need, they're not going to hate you any less if you're not talking to them. Right? It's true. They're not going to disagree with you any less if you're not talking to them. They're not going to diss on you any less if you're not there uh, basically talking about the things that are important to you. Uh, and now, more than ever, um, especially uh, uh, since we have this, uh, what appears to be, a rural friendly provincial government that loves to hate Toronto as well. They're just dumping us, us all the time. Well, that's something now we have in common with the rest of the, the cities across, uh, uh, across the province. Uh, we, have, we have some people who just <laughs> you love uh, to knock us around a bit. And, uh, but I, I think it's uh, what I learned from those round table conversations with those folks is that even though you may not agree often and even though you may your disagreements uh, um, will continue what's important is uh, to be there to be able to share information because the because that went a long way uh, to you know furthering our relationship and at the end of the day, we sat on a course where we worked out a number of issues. You know, buses then weren't stopping 500 meters north of Steeles uh, from the region, dropping their people off, and they'd have to walk half a kilometer uh, to the city town line. And TTC buses weren't stopping anymore 500 meters south of Steeles, uh, you know, further encouraging Torontonians who went to work out in that to, to have to work. We integrated some of that stuff, and now you have buses 
that actually crossed the border. And it came out of the Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, I rise to speak on this issue, and let me first of all be very clear. I mean, I'd like to move the motions that are here, because that's pretty clear what we need to do. Um, my issue is that uh, this notion of a membership, a full membership with, with AMO. I have nothing against AMO. In fact, I have nothing against any of the municipalities across this country. Um, I have been here for a while at this, um, uh, as my speaker, I, I can't hear myself. So I'd like to hear myself when I'm actually talking. It's helpful for me to think. Yeah, uh, councillors? Councillor Cole? Yes. Please? Oh. Okay. Okay, go Thank ahead. you, Speaker. Um, I, I'm actually not against AMO. I think that AMO, for what they do for their members, it's fantastic. Um, having been around here for some time when Roger Anderson and others came in uh, to tell us at uh, the executive committee that um, Toronto needed to ensure that they were a part of AMO because they were going to speak for us, I, I was offended then and I'm offended to this day, quite frankly. I have a mayor, we have a mayor who speaks for us as a member of council. We have a city of Toronto that over the last 15 years we've saved $1,950,000 by not being in AMO. We, in fact, can use that. We've used supportive housing, daycare spots, fixing potholes. Oh, maybe we should use that to um, put some youth hubs in place and so on, because these are resources that we can fully uh, expend. Um, I, I think that the, the report that we have in front of us that asks for a opportunity just to talk and figure out how we can work with them, I think that's fine. But to become a full-fledged member, I don't think that's a good thing, quite frankly. I believe that we can go on our own. I think that uh, Councillor Pasternak made the arguments, and there were solid arguments, quite frankly, because when we had an opportunity to be a member of AMO, they actually didn't have our back. And so that's why we left. And so the points that you've made about the casino, a negotiation, it was $100 million, and the other uh, mayors from across the, uh, the region said, no, they didn't want um, Toronto to have that. It's been made mention here, Speaker, about this notion that, you know, the conversation with medical officers of health across the municipality. Clearly, without being members of AMO, we work with them and we got good results. So I'm not quite sure what would really change if we were to expend $130,000 to become a member of this organization that we have worked with. In fact, I recall in 2004, we talked with staff, we've done a lot of work and I think we continue to do work to help AMO in areas where they actually are not, they do not have some of the skill sets and so on. We do that today. And I think that should continue in terms of that relationship. So I don't really see the benefits. And I know that AMO comes to FCM and facilitates us through the Ontario caucus with information. And by the way, Speaker, we actually had a member of Toronto City Council who was actually the president of FCM. His name was Jack Layton, and so we've actually had that. So I think it's been said here that uh, Toronto hasn't actually had that particular position. We, we've actually had that. And so, Speaker, it isn't that I'm against AMO. It's just that I can't see the realized benefits in terms of our full-fledged membership and our association. We have a population going on 2.9 million people. When Steve Clark and others and so on want to speak to Toronto, they can call the mayor and his staff can call the city manager to have discussions about uh, things that the province want to implement. Obviously, we know that uh, some of those discussions have not really taken place, and that's what we're trying to reset, put, press that reset button to make some changes so we can actually have dialogue with the province to address some of the fundamental things that we need to do. But I don't believe that a membership for this city of Toronto in AMO so that someone else can speak for us and when we talk about some of the uh, perhaps things that other municipalities may have as their uh, you know, specific um, criteria that helps their communities, while we may have similar, it is quite the same, in, it's quite dis dissimilar in terms of Toronto's propensity in terms of our size. I think that we have an opportunity to continue government-to-government -government relationship with the province. I mean, I'd love to have it fully with the federal government as well. 
we don't, but I don't believe that we need other uh, sort of the, this relationship with AMO to, to, to advance our interests. We can do that quite well. We do it quite well now, and I want to encourage us to continue. But at the same time, let's have an opportunity to converse with AMO and to have a relationship and so on, but not a full-fledged membership where the City of Toronto has to pay $130,000 annually. Thank you. Thank you. On the item, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. The item is adopted 22 to 2. Thank you. Okay, um, our next item is on page three, EX 6.7, City po uh, Powers to Regulate Firearms. Councillor Kerjianis, you held the item down. Now we do have the police here to answer questions. Uh, did you? Uh, did, uh, white, uh, plan, uh, what's in there? Pardon? I'm pleased to, to, to release the item and move staff recommendations. Okay, on the item, on um, favor? Recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Lai, please. The item is adopted 22 to 2. <clears throat> On page 4, EX 6.12, 2009, 2019 heads and beds levy. Councillor Ainsley, you held the item down. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I held it down because there's a report, report on this due from the controller, and I haven't read it yet or seen it. Okay, so continue holding it down. Thank you. Thank you. Page 4, EX 6.21, amendments to the procedures bylaw for the Board of Directors of TO Live. Councillor Perks? Thank you. I have questions. questions? Yes. Thank you. I have questions for the clerk. Um, uh, or maybe someone else can take this. As I understand it, what's in front of us is a request from uh, TO Live to be able to have meetings where people uh, FaceTime in or call in or, or just aren't physically present but are rather present through some electronic means. Is that correct? Yes, that's the essence of the request. Now, um, I've been on a number of city agency boards over the years and we've received uh, presentations and advice from staff that uh, there's a strong, from the clerk's department, that there is a strong and important principle behind having uh, the members of a decision-making body in the room. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's certainly correct. You're there's totally also the possibility of, of the public wishing to hear the uh, conduct of the meeting. Is, uh, can you elucidate a little bit what some of the reasoning is why the clerk's office takes that position? Well, this is a decision-making body that's appointed by council and really stands instead of council. So it's important that it has 
the same ability for the public to hear and see the decisions that are being made and, and the discussion around those decisions um, as any other council meeting or other meeting of a body appointed by council. So there, there's a real benefit, if I understand you, in terms of public transparency, public accountability, and making people believe that, you know, frankly, government's available to them and works for them, if by having meetings where all the members are present physically in a, in a room. Yes, that's correct. Okay. On a, on a related matter, is it legal for a, a City of Toronto council a committee or agency or board to have in-camera meetings where people phone in? No, that's... Uh prohibited under CODA. It's specifically prohibited. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other uh, questioners, uh, Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I, I apologize, I didn't write my motion, but I don't think it'll be hard. I'm gonna simply move receipt of this item. Um, as you heard from the clerk's office, uh, this body functions as an entity created by the Toronto, City of Toronto Council and members of the public who elect us to represent them should have the same expectations about the conduct of that board as they do about any board or agency or committee or this council meeting itself, which are that they can come in and watch our conduct during the meeting. They can see who we're talking to. They can know that you know, we're not uh, having a, a secondary conversation offline outside the room by a, a second cell phone or some other means. In other words, the stuff of democracy happens in front of human eyes in a room. And, you know, as exciting as new technology often is to all of us, we have to remember that that foundational rock, that foundational rock legitimizes the work we do. Now, I, I, I note there aren't that many people here, hello, Mr. Ahi, but nevertheless, Somebody can, somebody can phone up Jonathan and say, hey, were they passing secret notes? Did they, you know, all run behind just before they voted and agree on what they were going to do? And Jonathan can say to them, no, I was watching. They were all in the room. They all knew, what they, like, it's transparent. Your government served you that day. I think they made the wrong decision. But nevertheless, I was able to observe how they did it. And without that foundational rock, we erode further the already very precarious trust that people have in government. From time to time, people say to me, well, you know, why don't you run for some other different level of government, different order of government, the federal or provincial one? And I always tell them, my answer is always no. Although it's unlikely I would ever be in a cabinet, I would never serve in a government where decisions were made behind closed doors. I would never serve in such a government. I think it's fundamentally un undemocratic. This forum, the way we operate, the rules we operate under, I think is, a, is as close as we've got in this country to a fundamentally democratic and accountable and transparent way of making decisions on behalf of the people we represent. And undermining that, undermining that for what is essentially, as I understand it, a convenience argument troubles me deeply. Now remember, in addition, that if you want to serve on one of the, the corporations or boards or agencies that the City of Toronto has, we have a civic appointments process. And many times more people apply to be on those boards than actually get to serve. Many, many Torontonians are eager to serve this city, to volunteer their time to serve on a board or agency. If we added a simple question to the application process, would you be willing to attend meetings in person, I think we'd still wind up with incredibly qualified candidates. I think we'd still be in a great position to make sure that Toronto in all of its richness and diversity is represented on our various boards, agencies, commissions, and corporations. So I put it to you, why shouldn't we simply tell people if you want to serve the public in this form of government, one of the things we require of you is that you make the meeting. You actually show up and you let people see you do the work. 
That's why I encourage you all to receive this request. I think that it's, it would be unhealthy, and I think once it happens here, there's going to be an avalanche of requests, and democracy will take a hit here in the City of Toronto. Thank, thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm just rising to actually support uh, Councillor Perks, and I've had to think about this a little bit um, because it just seems like such a logical thing in uh, that committee or to agree to phone-ins. And um, then I started thinking about because Toronto Community Housing, which is not a clerked committee, it's a corporation on its own, uh, we do phone-ins. Phone in for committees and we phone in for the board, uh, which I also find a little difficult not to have everybody in the same room, but that's the operation there. And then realize that the tr uh, TRCA, which used to allow phone ins, no longer allows phone ins. That's not a model that is supported, and apparently it's uh, in the articles somewhere of operation that they changed it. So you have to be there in person in order to deliberate. And I did think about this committee, which is this TO Live, and in the past, it had not been a clerk committee. Prior to all the troubles and putting the three civic theaters together, it had just been a board, and I think that was allowed to phone in at that point. But the fact that it's actually a clerked committee, it's an official, the clerk is there, another secretary is there, all of the business is done in that way, it's run, in a way that we would expect that the clerk committee can't do things in private, have to do certain things in public. So I do think that um, while it might be easier for the members, it might not be a great precedent for a clerked committee. And having heard the clerk mention that, I, I think we should be careful how we're going to proceed with committees that have, uh, that have the clerk's time not only at the meeting, but in the preparation and everything else and have a certain special relationship with, uh, with the city and with city council. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was at the meeting when we had this discussion at TO Live, um, and, and I think the board gets it. Democracy is not in jeopardy here. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Perks, for that. What this board wants to do, first of all, they recognize the rules that we are under. They recognize that if uh, they're doing, um, going to be somewhere else and, and they're, they're, they're phoning in or, or they're on uh, video, that they can't vote. They recognize that um, in private they can't participate. I think really what they were doing is saying that at some point in the future that when we look at technology and we, we decide that it, it can work and where we can potentially have that, that they would maybe be in position for that. This wasn't a big debate there. This was not, you know, something that they were absolutely saying they want to have. It was just one of these, you know, it would make it easier. A lot of these people are in the entertainment industry. They do travel. We all travel. I get that. And I think even in the corporate world, we, I understand that. But it was the opportunity when there are meetings, they could, you know, call in or video in to participate really to view. It, they understand there's no decision-making ability here. There's no democracy in jeopardy here. It was really just a simple request. So that's really, I just wanted to give you the context of the conversation at the board. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I've uh, grappled with this decision before on a board that uh, I participated on. And I'm going to um, take the same view as uh, Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Perks. Uh, I have some concerns about where this will lead if uh, we begin to open this box up further. And uh, for that reason, I will be supporting the motion to receive the report. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Mayor Tory. I sort of grappling, Madam Speaker, with whether to speak or not. And I, I just because I want to offer a slightly different reason, <coughs> pardon me, and I wouldn't feel right if I didn't. 
uh, put it forward. Um, I think on most of the corporations on whose boards I served before I came uh, to public life, um, they permitted telephone board meetings. And they permitted them for emergency, cir they, they were meant to be for emergency circumstances, um, where, for example, there'd be a transaction that was just getting finalized and you needed to have a, a relatively quick board meeting just to say yes to something that had been thoroughly presented at a prior meeting. So it was, it was nonsensical not to have the ability to have that kind of an urgent meeting, especially when you had directors who were coming in, in those cases from across the country and from across the continent. Um, I, 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 I was, and I quietly just said to uh, Councillor Crawford, because I so much respect the work that is being done by all these boards, including by the TOLI board, I was going to vote against, in favor of, of Councillor Perks' motion for, for a slightly different reason than all of those that have been articulated, which is that I, uh, I think part of the problem in, in the public sector generally with these boards oftentimes is um, a failure on the governance side in that there are, first of all, too many meetings of the board. And I know that sounds nonsensical or it sounds like it doesn't make sense because how could you possibly have too many meetings? But I think if you're employing management to do their job properly in these different bodies, then management should be allowed to do their job. Um, and I think we, as politicians, I'll include myself because I am one, are inclined when we have these board meetings and sit on these boards to help these people more than they need help to do their job. Um, I've often said, you know, when I was in business, and I don't think it's, it's, it's any different in public life, that if you don't like the job management is doing, don't do their job for them, get new management. Um, so I think the result of, of, of having more meetings than is necessary is that it puts pressure on some people who have a busy work life because, of course, we also don't pay people an amount of money that reflects the loss of the time that they're taking away from whatever it else it is they do. And, and again, I understand the concept of public service uh, very well. Um, but we end up having more of these board meetings. And I think that if we actually said to people, look, we're going to have a reasonable number of board meetings, and it doesn't mean two a year. It means you have less than sort of one a month, which is what oftentimes these boards do. Uh, let the management run the company, got good management had the board serve its role, which is as an oversight body and not as a body that's supposed to be getting into the operations up to their elbows, we wouldn't have people then saying, I need to use the phone. Because I think if you're on these boards, quite frankly, you have a pretty strong obligation to show up. I used to say that actually I thought that directors on private sector companies, notwithstanding that there are quite big liabilities involved there, as there are, I guess, in the public sector, all they had to do was two things. One, read the material, and two, show up. And if you remove the showing up part, you know, so that they just have to read the materials, uh, I just think that it, it, it is not uh, sort of commensurate with the sort of degree of, uh, I'll call it prestige. I think it's prestigious to be on the board of TO Live or to be on the board of any of these different organizations that we oversee. Um, and I hope you're going to get the very best people to apply. And I think, as someone said a moment or two ago, if they apply, then they should understand that they're going to have to come to a certain number of board meetings. And I think if they're discouraged from that because they like to, they travel and business, for example, then we should probably look at whether we're having too many board meetings as opposed to looking uh, at, at the possibility of people phoning it in. Um, so I will vote with Councillor Perks to uh, receive this. Uh, it, it is not the first time we voted together, but it certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> the exception as opposed to the rule, but I think uh, he's right on this one, and a number of others are that have spoken as well. Thanks, I think Speaker. You get shots for that. Thank <laughs> you. <coughs> okay, on the motion, we put it on the screen. By Councillor Perks, recorded vote. Councillor Thompson, please, and thank you. The motion to receive the item carries 23 to 3, to 2, sorry. Okay. Our next, our next item is page four, EX 6.25, not bear in the air. Deputy Mayor Minna Wong held the item down. Do we have questions to staff? You know, I... Councillor Carroll. 
Who am I asking? I'm not sure who's answering questions. Who's answering the questions on uh, EX 6.25? Okay, go ahead. So th I, I asked the question because the, uh, the flight path that we're, we're talking about actually makes its way to my ward, uh, but it's, it's an issue that has, uh, that has uh, been confounding council since uh, Councillor Matlow first became a councillor. That was about the time they changed the flight path so that they really spend a lot of time in the, in the heart of the, the city. So the question is this, have staff had an ongoing conversation about this offline that, that, uh, that perhaps council is not aware of? Or, or did we have the conversations at the various points of uh, uh, councillors moving motions and unless we move motions we don't check in with them? <laughs> Through you, Madam Speaker, I, I can't speak to what we have or have not done specifically on this, Councillor Carroll. I think that's an answer to the question in a way. Yeah. Um, uh, would it be helpful if what we had, because we seem to keep, uh, we seem to keep moving motions, then we make, then we make small adjustments, and then it, the problem just crops up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there already uh, a place where we could have a regular check-in with the GTAA, or, uh, or is that the motion we need to move that we find a solution, but then we continue to meet so that if the solution just causes a problem somewhere else, we can continue to adapt. Right. So through you, Madam Speaker, I believe our GM of ECDEV can help us with this. So in terms of official channels, there's always the local councillors, especially around the airport, yes. sit on a number of advisory committees. Also the GTAA comes into the Economic and Community Development Committee yes. every year. They were at the last meeting and gave yes. a presentation and they usually address some of the noise issues and the working groups that they have around those noise issues. But in terms of a detailed discussion on NAVCAN's routes, planning right. and changes, uh, as far as I know, the city's never had any official conversation with NAVCAN about it. So probably that's what we're missing is that, that we should actually be talking to NAVCAN. They're the ones that determine the uh, routes flying in and out of Toronto. And that would be the one thing we haven't tried. Sorry? To the, to the best of my recollection, uh, recollection, that would be something we haven't tried. And I know that I, I haven't been part of any conversations okay. with NAVCAN. And thank you for, for coming to the floor, because Madam Speaker, the, the next thing I was going to ask is if I could ask a question having to do with economic development. We have the concern, I, I get the name of the motion and I, and I feel for my residents. Uh, I'm in the same flight path as them, even though I live a little south of my ward, so I actually feel it. But we also have an economic uh, uh, imperative, don't we, uh, to be uh, a crossroads for, for air travel globally. Our goal is to actually have a busy airport at Pearson, isn't it? Correct. So, I mean, the, the economic impact, <clears throat> and they went through the, uh, a very thorough discussion about that, is huge. One of the largest, if not the largest economic impact, probably outside of, of, of the financial industry here in Toronto. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, both in the area, second largest employment zone from the city's perspective, right. uh, let alone from the GTA's perspective. Um, and those stats alone <clears throat> can drive FDI, can't they? Correct. Well, yeah. Many so. I mean, a lot of the pitching is based upon the fact that they have the second most direct flights to international cities of any airport in North America after uh, New York. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. As, uh, as Councillor Carroll alluded to, uh, yeah, it was a couple years after I was, uh, I was first elected. Uh, I moved a motion, I believe, uh, I think it was in early 2012 alongside Councillor Parker, I believe, to request that uh, the city manager engage in the discussion with the federal government and NAFCAN on the new flight paths and the impact on our communities. And then later in the year, I believe uh, I moved a motion alongside Councillor Robinson to reiterate it, 
right? And so we like we kept sort of asking the city manager to engage in that conversation, not because we were pretending, and I say this in a form of a question, but just to provide you background because you weren't there. Um, not to pretend that we have purview over the flight paths or the noise, but to recognize that this is in the federal realm, but that we as advocates for Torontonians should be at the table to discuss the adverse impacts. Um, I've, never, I've never seen any report coming out of that though. I've never seen any. Uh, so would the city manager commit? We don't need any more motions. We've, we've moved those motions. I believe probably half a dozen councillors since the, that time have moved similar motions. Could the city manager provide an undertaking given that those motions have been moved and approved relentlessly and over and over again to engage NAVCAN and the federal government in this discussion about the impacts of the noise that are created by the flight paths and, 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 and the, the, the air noise over our cities and our neighborhoods and then report back this year on where that discussion is at and what Toronto can do to advocate. In other words, can you follow through with the motions? Uh, through the speaker, uh, it seems very reasonable to me, and I'll undertake that uh, uh, that work if uh, having been directed to do it before. So uh, in, in terms of reporting back within this year, I'll give you an update this year. And through you, Madam Speaker, would uh, the city manager and his staff review the exact directions of each of those motions of and make sure that each of those each of those directions are spoken to this year in the form of a report to council? So, of course, uh, through the speaker, I mean, it's, it's the direction that you've given the city manager. I will reflect that direction to the parties that I'll be talking to, uh, which will guide our conversation. And on the basis of that, I'm sure they'll have some kind of response and I'll report back on that response. Okay, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, uh, I too uh, uh, receive a fair volume of, of uh, complaints about uh, air traffic noise. And it's, it seems to be symbolic of major change of not just flight paths, but elevation. Is that something, is that something you heard? Are they coming <coughs> in lower over a longer period period of their flight time? So noise is a function obviously of the location above you and the, and the steepness of the decline and the, and the slope. So uh, sometimes they, depending upon conditions, as I understand, I'm not an expert on this, this is just what I've been told, uh, is on takeoff, especially on takeoffs, how steep it is and on, on, when, on an approach, how shallow it is over a long period of time. And, uh, those those rules change depending upon volume of flights and uh, uh, operational necessities. I mean, one of the problems here is they've got to get into the airport somewhere, and now that the area is built up everywhere, it's always going to be over a built-up area. There's no way of coming into our airport with a east-west wind pattern except over built-up areas. So um, they are very well aware of it, I, you know. Uh, but in the conversations I had, I just came back from London, England, where there's a huge debate about uh, a fourth runway, a third runway, uh, east-west runway, and it, all of this discussion is very timely there. Yeah, no, I, okay. Uh, no, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, the complaints we're getting are not people who, you know, move to the airport and then are complaining about runway noise. These are, these are people who have been living in the area for decades. And, and the flights never bothered them at all. They never really noticed them. They never really heard them. Uh, and, and, and things things have changed. And generally speaking, that change has caused this problem. Now, I, I've mentioned flight paths. I've mentioned elevation. Uh, but there was also, is there, was there also a new runway uh, at Pearson in the last, uh, that opened up in the last year? In fact, there was a safety report on it in, in the media. Can't comment on the runway configuration. Sorry. I might also add the industry is working hard at making planes quieter, and so uh, over a longer haul, that that will be one of the yeah. uh, saving elements to it. Yeah. Uh, but to your comment about changes, the, 
they were flying over built-up areas before. Those people became much more used to the sound. Now they're over areas where people are not used to the sound. And over a period of time, hopefully, they will become more used to it. Um, they, uh, the GTAA uh, did, launched a community outreach program last year. And I believe that included the installation of sound monitors. And as a matter of fact, one was put in Robert Hitts Park, which is, which is in my ward. Were we engaged at all with that study of, of noise levels? And not, not that I'm aware of as to the location of those monitoring. They're all over the city, is my understanding. They are. They have a, I, th I was going to look up on the thing whether I could go on their website and, and actually get the readings, but uh, my understanding is pretty public information. All right, the last question is, I guess there's someone at GTAA that uh, Jessica Singh, she's community outreach. Do we have any kind of um, dialogue with, with her or anyone there? I haven't there? had a dialogue with her personally. Uh, most of all, my contact is with the senior GR person, Lori McKee. Is there anything we can do to, to affect change? Uh, my guess is there's very little we can do that's under I mean, there's safety regulations and operations of the airport. They already have pretty strict uh, guidelines on time of flights, probably stricter than many other cities. Okay. Was there any uh, loosening of the rules? Of <laughs> you another, did. Another broken promise. I was listening. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that. Come on. Just, just very quickly. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, was, there, was there any amendments to the time planes could take off and land in Toronto? Was there an extension of hours to allow that? Uh, I can't, I don't know, Councillor. I'm sorry. I'll find out for you. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minnewang, it was your item. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'm going to digress in it for a moment and talk about these reports that were asked for and you, you didn't get them. I remember back in 2007 when Shirley Hoy killed the Waterfront Toronto Reference Group. She promised to report back and 12 years later, I'm still waiting. In fact, last year, or when Peter Wallace was, uh, was the city manager, I, I asked him about it and moved a motion for them to report back and I'm still waiting for it. So I feel your pain, Councillor Matlow, for not getting these reports. Um, I will say, I'm, I'm glad that people are kind of, uh, this, this, my request for a report has caught the imagination of Council. I think we do need one and I think we need ours um, because I think that uh, the GTA have their own interests and they're trying to protect, you know, what they're doing. Um, and so, so I think we need our, need our own report. Let me say this, I'm not, I'm not um, you know, the motion was structured as, uh, because my residents in Don Mills raise these concerns. The people in Don Mills are not of nature, well, actually, some of them are, but most of them aren't NIMBY in nature. Um, we're prepared to absorb our fair share of airplanes flying over our neighborhoods. But the information that's been presented to me is that it's disproportionate. The disproportionate number of, of flights are coming over my community and a certain number of communities and certain other communities are, are, are not getting their fair share. So, so I think there are issues with regard to the, the, the flight paths um, and I think there are also issues with regard to the height of the planes. I take what um, uh, Mr. Williams says with regard to it's a big city, um, there's, it's a big built up city, um, our uh, Pearson Airport is growing, uh, it's successful and we have, you know, airplanes are a fact of a big city. But what I am looking for is, um, before we move forward with this, I am looking for a report that gives us uh, an unbiased analysis of where those flights are coming <coughs> and going to make sure that no one community or communities are taking a significant and disproportionate amount of airplane traffic over their neighborhoods. And I'll also say that uh, Councillor Holliday, who uh, has a motion, uh, that he, then I'm, 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 I'm supportive of this. Uh, we just need to get to the truth. And then I think that uh, we can't have an impact on influencing um, Pearson Airport if we speak as one voice, 
and if council says that we're not happy with it, um, I don't believe, uh, and I stand to be corrected, but I don't believe the city has spoken with one voice on this particular issue, and maybe the GTA has taken advantage of this, but uh, the time has come to do proper research and speak as one voice on what's fair for the residents of the city. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a, a motion, if I could ask the clerks to put that on the screen. And the motion is to request that the city manager, in preparation of the report, uh, to consult with uh, local community groups um, that have knowledge on this subject. Um, if you can imagine Ward 2 out in the West End, I'm immediately adjacent to the airport. Uh, and I'm familiar with the noise of the aircraft from both runways um, going east and west and north and south. Uh, so to, to say that this is an ongoing concern in my community is probably an understatement. Uh, but in being a local councillor, uh, I have come to get to know a number of groups with tremendous amount of expertise in this. The Mark Lenwood Homeowners Association, I think I've been uh, engaged in this, this particular subject matter for decades. Uh, there's a new group. The Community Alliance for Air Safety also out in the West End that has a lot of knowledge uh, in um, the history and some of the changes that are happening in and around the airport. And I think it would be of value to speak to those groups because they could help inform the report. I, I will not understate though the importance of the airport uh, and the complexity of this issue. The importance of the airport, I can say there are many, many constituents in my area that are well employed because of the airport uh, and whose businesses rely on the airport. Uh, and whose uh, secondary business rely on the airport. So it, it is an important economic uh, center uh, in the west end of the city and, and profoundly affects the, the constituents that I serve, but also the sound that comes from the aircraft and uh, the operations of such a large place obviously have impacts on our way of life. And uh, I think it is something that council should pay attention to. And I look forward to uh, any report coming forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Carroll? Just, just briefly, Madam Speaker, I just wanted to give, uh, um, give a little bit of comfort to the councillors who actually are from the West End and much closer to the airport and, and, and think, my goodness, we're making a fuss. But um, I, I just want to say this. Where, where this did become an issue in my uh, uh, community, and it was it took a while for it to, to take hold. It was a couple of days, a couple of years, I should say, after the flight paths changed. In 2012, there was a very concentrated flight path change whereby planes coming up from the US and sometimes from Montreal, they literally come along the waterfront, fly up above Young Street, and as they get to Midtown, they do a big circle. So they're going, they're going uh, past us in Don Mills, out over, I can tell you, they get as far as Birchmount, because uh, my father, when he was in the hospital there, counted planes. He loved counting planes and, and enjoyed it. And then they come back and fly over my ward, just north of the 401. And there is an attempt, I just wanted to give people the comfort, there is an attempt to vary that by, by a small number of degrees. If you look at their actual map that they keep and they track it, it's not the exact same spot. They widen the circle and then they bring it back in so that they're not flying over the same house the same number of times every single day and that seems to have have an impact and i appreciate their efforts in doing that the other thing is they have been very responsive to my community in terms of coming up and actually meeting with the community you may or may not have noticed them in the corner of your environment days pearson is there reminding people that well, we know uh, it's not great to have us flying over you all the time. We're a big part of the economy that employs you. And that's a great message to be sending people when, they're, when you're, you're dealing with the most community-minded people in an environment day. That happens at all of our environment days. And so uh, I think it's a great addition to them. They, they generally get high traffic at their, at their booth. And it's an extra information point at which when someone complains, they can tell them about the efforts that they are making. I think we'll find that out in the, in the form of a report. And if, at the very least, that report reminds people how frequently they're willing to come out and how you go about organizing a community meeting and that they will come out and do it, that will go a long way. 
If we add to that a check-in on a regular basis, maybe it's a three- or four-year review of some sort with NAVCAN so that they know that we're doing all we can to mitigate it. But, guys, if this is going to be the number two airport in North America, we, we gotta, we've got to have a partnership that works together. Then I think we can be number two and then stay there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Those are my comments. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, uh, I will be brief on this, but I, I, I must say I sympathize with all my colleagues, uh, Councillor Carroll and Councilman Wong. Um, I, too, represent a ward that is actually right next to the airport and actually uh, runway 23, which is actually the largest runway in the country, which brings in the uh, kind of heaviest and largest planes, actually comes right over my community as well. Um, but I, I just want to, this is actually conversations I've had with my community, with the airport, uh, on a number of different occasions, and, and myself being a pilot, I, I, I wouldn't mind just putting in a, a minute, um, my two cents worth on it. Um, look, I, I think it's a very complex issue when we are talking about uh, flight paths, because there's a number of factors that determine them from, I think, starting off is the different airports in the region actually affect the flight paths because, uh, you know, uh, Billy Bishop Airport has their own flight paths into the city, uh, Oshawa Airport has their own flight paths, Hamilton has their flight paths, so Pearson, being the largest airport in the country, is navigating all of them, as well as we can't predict uh, certain traffic patterns on any given day because of wind and weather and visibility and and all those factors that kind of uh, play into it, and especially other planes. Um, you have to give more space for other planes so they go wider and cut in and, and all that stuff. So I think, you know, needless to say, I, I understand the, the challenges of grappling with this issue, and, and, and I sympathize, as I said, with all my colleagues, and of course I sympathize with the community I represent, because um, I, I live under it as well. But I think if we're going to have conversations, I Look, I, I am one of the biggest uh, supporters and fans of the GTAA, and, and I will continue to be, but uh, having conversations on this is, I, I believe, better directed, um, as our general manager said, to NAV Canada and uh, to the federal government, because they fall under the Ministry of Transportation. So I think any change really is driven uh, through our federal colleagues and through the Ministry of Transportation. Um, so um, uh, that is what I would uh, submit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll be brief. Um, I'm happy to hear all these comments. I'm really pleased because um, I don't know if anybody remembers this moment two terms ago when Councillor Matlow and I moved this issue and we still haven't got the report back, but there was a paper plane created and flown in the chamber, and uh, to much laughter. So I'm happy to see there's been a real shift over the years in the thinking, and, and uh, the impacts are greater on our neighbourhoods than ever before. I worked on this issue before I was a city councillor. Uh, it had a huge impact on my ward, and the, the flight path that goes over Don Mills is a trombone effect. Uh, heading over my ward and then into the Don Mills area. So uh, we always wanted to get t-shirts that said low and loud and people are just getting more and more fed up with this. So um, even before I was a city councillor, I did uh, city councillor, I did deputations at NAVCAN to talk to them about the concerns from uh, our neighbourhoods. So I really hope that finally we will see uh, some content or report some direction around this on how we navigate this. Obviously, it's, it, they have to go over the, the neighbourhoods, but there must be ways to um, reduce the impacts on people living in Toronto. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, on the motion by Councillor Holliday, if we can put it on the screen. All in favour? Carried. Item as amended. Pardon? Recorded vote? Recorded vote. On the motion or item as amended? Okay, on, on the item as amended. Recorded vote.
Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Fillingman, you're seated, please. The item is amended, carries unanimously 23 in favor. Thank you. Next item is on page six, EC 5.8, Councillor Thompson. Grants to Specialized Collections Museums. Speaker, yes, I had um, circulated the motion, and I think that uh, Councillor Robinson had questions. Um, so I, I simply wanted to move those uh, motion, and uh, I can speak to it. And then perhaps because I move the motion, you can ask me questions. I don't know if you have asked questions of staff. Oh, okay. Set five nine. On on nine. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. All right, so I can uh, move uh, 5.8. Yes, and we do have, um, there was an advanced circulation on yes. the item. It's on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. Okay, EC 5.9. Councillor Robinson, uh, Robinson, you had questions? I just wanted to uh, ask staff a couple questions on this. Um, so the, the concept here is to review, mm. I, I understand you're moving another motion, a similar motion, is that correct? Yeah. Similar to the last yes. item, okay. So that's what I'll ask questions about. Uh, even though the motion hasn't been placed, we know what it looks like. So thank you for that, Councillor Thompson. That's what I just said, yes, thank you. So um, my question is, does this ultimately change the funding allotment? for these organizations, or what exactly is the objective here? It could or it could not. It depends on the review that we've taken. We have not had the opportunity for a significant period of time of taking a look at the majors category. Uh, because, and over time, it has sort of grown without a lot of design based upon individual situations that occurred from year to year. So now with uh, changing funding patterns the province and the federal governments and uh, now with a much bigger basket of, of items now with a lot more history for the Toronto Arts Council it's timely that we take a look at what organizations should be in the same basket together and what organizations uh, should be put in different baskets so it's a it's really an analysis of baskets and baskets. bundles the way that you're going to parcel off various entities. And that then would lead to the appropriate uh, criteria that would be used to allocate funds that are awarded by council to the program to the individual organizations. Okay, and so I guess my concern is the um, a lot of these uh, institutions are dependent on this funding. So my concern is, to be brutally honest, is altering that, uh, those, uh, those numbers, because a lot of these institutions would like to see that money go up. Um, that may not be likely, but I know certainly they'd like it to be stabilized. So um, what, what is, how, what, how, how may that be impacted through this so process? We, we, well, first of all, we will embark on a process that's fully inclusive of conversations with both the boards and senior staffs of all the organiza organizations. We'll take a look at uh, council priorities that have been set, um, take a look at the pattern I've already mentioned, what's happening from grants uh, by other orders of government, and uh, what the highest priorities are for the city, and who's best to administer and make those recommendations to council. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Thompson. Just waiting for my mic. Oh, there we are. So, Speaker, I have a similar motion that I, as I had for um, EC 5.8, and um, you've heard through the questions that uh, Councillor Robinson has asked the general manager 
and I fully agree with the general manager in the discussions we've been having for some time. Uh, there's a lot of pressure actually on um, economic development. I think the general manager had, for example, last year a motion in front of the budget uh, committee looking for funding, for example, for the, um, the major festivals and what have you, that was not granted. Nonetheless, I think it's important for us to be able to review um, any organizations that we provide resources to to ensure that those organizations are meeting the city's intended objective and so on. Um, we have a lot of uh, different organizations that are coming forward now to ask for resources and so on. I think it's the perfect time to review and assess how we fund these particular arts organizations. Um, I don't know whether or not the uh, funding will be reduced or whether or not they'll remain the same or whether or not they will be increased and so on, but it's through a process of assessing um, what the ultimate benefits are in terms of the notion of bang for the buck, so to speak. And so um, the organizations are getting these resources now, are getting resources as it relates to these particular, um, uh, uh, the, the, the item that's in front of us. But I think it's important for us to review everything that we do. And I don't believe that in any of our funding formulation that there is a specific aspect that would suggest or that denotes that organization will get funding in perpetuity. I think it's important for us to assess these things and what the impacts are and so on. This leads to that opportunity of our staff being able to do so. Staff spoke about the Arts Council and the funding that they do. I think the numbers went up to $50 million that they get to distribute uh, funding throughout uh, different uh, organizations and so on. And so I think it's important for us to be able to assess all of these things. So this is the intended purpose of the, this particular motion in addition to the previous one. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any further speakers? Okay, on the amendment by Councillor Thompson. On favor? Recorded vote. Councillor Karachianis, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Bailau, when you're seated. Councillor Perutza, please. Thank you. The amendment carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Item, Item is amended on favor, carried. Uh, page six, EC 5.10. Councillor Robinson, you held the item down. Questions to staff? Yes, I, yes thank you very much. Um, again, uh, this event is a new product. Um, what is the city's investment to date on this uh, cash investment? I think we've, over, uh, through the chair, over the course of the last few years, in terms of helping with feasibility studies and planning studies, uh, we've awarded uh, $300,000 total to date. $300,000? I think that's the right number. And Sorry, I wasn't clear. Is that cash or in kind? Well, that would be cash. So $300,000 in uh, cash, and then also sounds like some in-kind gestures as well. No, we haven't done any in-kind. No in-kind. We haven't had an event to use in-kind, as you pointed. Okay, so, but, but there's obviously some work done on feasibility. Correct. And what is the feasibility of this being a success? Well, for feasibility and structure and design of the item, of, sorry, of the event, uh, the event's morphed considerably since it was first raised, I think, four or five years ago. Uh, and they've now got a appropriate staff they've developed relationships with sponsors and with uh, um, other orders of government so that the budget has grown uh, more significantly 
sorry, the budget has become more, more uh, noticeably reasonable. The original budgets were in the five to ten million range. Uh, now it's in the two million range. And is that is that common that the city uh, would invest in an unknown product like this? There's a lot of festivals and events looking for funding in this city, so this this is an unproven commodity. Is that typical that we'd invest three hundred thousand? Uh, we have a we have a program called Toronto Special Events Incentive Program, TSIP, which is for the very express purpose of helping start up festivals. One of the outcomes from the mayor's task force after the Pan Am Games mm -hmm. that was yep. led by uh, uh, Sad Rafi, Savan Pavatsian, and uh, Mr. Nixon was yeah, cool. uh, to take a look at what should happen. And one of their answers was. We need more grown in Toronto major events. We shouldn't be relying on one-offs continually coming here. And so as a result of that, we set up an incentive plan program, and we've been using that on a number of cases. And so it does very much fit the division's uh, recommendations to council that we do this. Okay. There are, so for instance, to your point, Toronto Arts Council does not fund startup organizations. So they would not, they cannot go to the Toronto Arts Council. Their Toronto Arts Council, as most arts foundations do, want to look for a track record so that we as a city represent one of the few sources of startup um, funding. And so how would you be measuring the success of this festival uh, related to economic impact, uh, et cetera? So we would, we would set out a number of criteria around uh, does it meet the artistic excellence, uh, diversity of artistic uh, display, attendance obviously, uh, funding by other partners, sponsorship, uh, earned revenue, uh, all of those things that we typically use to evaluate festivals. And are the other levels of government participating? I think you alluded to that, but if do you have any numbers on uh, I don't have them with me, I'm okay. sorry, but... Uh, Part of this program is that it's required to get assistance from other orders. Okay, so thank that you very much. Prerequisite. Great, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Just a couple of quick questions because I, I refresh my memory. I, I'm remembering back to way earlier discussions when we first started discussing this. Um, this is based on the Venice Biennale. We, we've sort of uh, used them as, a, as a, an inspiration. Um, has there been interaction with them to find out how they've been successful for 58 years? So we've had con connections and contacts directly and through the organizers with many of the Biennales. There's over 200 around the world. Yes. Miami is a famous one, Basel, as well as Venice. Right. So yes, we have. Right. So there's now sort of a cooperative amongst them. So you don't have to get on a plane and go to all these places. There's a sort of cooperative conversation amongst them. Right. Is there a feeling that there's, there's, you know, as we embark upon this, there'll be some form of mentorship from that community? We're, but we belong to a number of global organizations, one of which uh, on the cultural side of things. So yes is the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, you held the item down. I, I just had questions, uh, Madam Speaker. I don't need to speak on the item. Does anybody want to speak? Okay, on the item, all in favor? Carried. Councillor, our next item is the clothing boxes, but Councillor Ainsley is left. of council uh, declared an interest on this, so I think it's important that we record the vote, because she's out of the room. Which boxes? On, on the item we just, uh, the item we just Oh, okay, debated. so we'll have a recorded vote then.
Councillor Thompson, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 20 in favour. Thank you. Okay, so our next item um, is the clothing boxes. Now, Councillor Ainsley held the item down and he said, like, I would really appreciate it if councillors are leaving um, the council meetings and they have an item that they pal down, they at least tell us that they're leaving because now, I mean, we're at the item, so should we deal with the item even though Councillor Ainsley has held the item down? Like, huh? Yeah, but, you know, if councillors are leaving, uh, they should at least inform the, the speaker that they're leaving uh, and like that they're, they've held items down, you know? Yeah. So it's, I just, I think, I just don't think, you know, it's really inappropriate for members of council just to get up and leave and not even inform. I'm gonna start, yes. So question, we have qu questions to staff. Councillor Perks, we'll start the questions. Councillor Perks. Um, I'd like to begin, I guess, with some solid questions to the solid waste staff. So with these drop boxes, do we have any procedure, process, or anything like that to ensure that materials going into these boxes are reused, recycled, or downcycled to the highest possible extent? Do we manage or audit it in any way? Through you, Madam Chair, to the Council, Solid Waste does not have any follow-up procedures once the materials are in the boxes, no. So we have no way of knowing what happens to the materials that go in there other than what the operator claims? Correct. We don't audit it, we don't review it, it we there, don't verify it in any way? Through you, uh, Madam Chair, it's private operations and we don't get involved. Okay. Without uh, commenting, but, but just to give me a general sense of the industry, uh, are there, are there, is there a range of possible outcomes depending on, on the operator in, you know, in terms of whether the material gets reused or recycled into a good use or re downcycled or simply landfilled? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. There are multiple options that a vendor or a company can do, either upcycle, downcycle, or put into a landfill. And given that, that you don't audit it and we don't have any tests that we apply to these people, uh, when we approve these, we're flying blind in terms of environmental outcomes. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, that's correct. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Councillor Carroll. Well, yes, Madam Speaker, it, it's, I, I think it's a, a special themed council session where we bring up items that we've brought up many times, about every five years. The, the provisions that, that, uh, that the committee is recommending gobsmack me because I thought we went through this debate and many years ago uh, began a process of verifying that, that these charitable drop boxes were in fact charities. Councillor Howard Mosco, who hasn't been a councillor here for a couple of terms now, went through a process to make that our normal follow-up process, did he not? Uh, you're correct. This, this item has been before us, I believe, in 2013 or 2014. Um, what we do is uh, we allow charities and businesses uh, who operate and use clothing to participate in this space. If you are a charity, you need to declare you are a charity. You need to put that on your box and you, say, you need to say that these funds are going towards charity and uh, the, the, they are required to have a permit on them. So did we not at that time, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, 1C, did we not determine at that time or the consideration before that that we weren't going to allow them if you weren't a charity? It's bad enough that sometimes it's a wonderful charity, there's a particular one that's very egregious and I'm not going to name it, but 
there are some charities that, that are just going to sell this stuff and it's going to end up on a boat using emissions to get wherever it's going. But did we not make it impossible to have one of these boxes if you're not a charity? No, we did not. Is it within our power to do that? Rather than saying today that you have to have a little sign on your box, I can just imagine how comically fine print it will be. Is it within our uh, legislative possibilities, is it within our toolbox that we could make it impossible to put one of these things on the public realm when you're not a charity? Yes, they can, but with permission. So first of all, they are typically, they're not on the public realm in most cases. They are on uh, private property. Well, that was going to be my next question. Now can we go one step further and say we don't want them lining the edge of a shopping center uh, parking lot either if they're not a charity? So uh, it's, it's up to council to determine what, how strict they want to be on these. We're really on where they could be located, two per property, have the uh, authorization of the properties to have them there. Uh, is really what we're about and what we want to really ensure is that they're cleaned up. They can become quite an eyesore with, with uh, waste that's not cleaned up regularly. So that's the, kind of the largest number of complaints that we receive on these. And then there's also, there's a number of illegal boxes in this space. Um, those are the ones that we have challenges with that are dropped on the public realm that they've put a very limited investment in. And uh, our challenge is, is removing those and storing them and destroying them and all the pieces that go with that. Okay. Thank you. I'm a, I feel an amendment coming on. I have one more question, and then we have some members' motions that we're going to uh, introduce. Councillor Cole. Yes. Uh, a lot of the boxes I see there on the public realm right now, how do we get them removed? So again, that's a challenge. Um, we're in municipal licensing and standards. Our, <laughs> our teams do, uh, do inspections of these. We would have to partner uh, with a third party group to, to remove them. Um, again, you're talking about someone else's property, so that makes it a challenge. You're correct, they're not meant to be on the public realm, so they shouldn't be there. We like to work with the operator and the owner to have them moved into the appropriate location. Uh, but again, these, these uh, fly-by-night ones that are just dropped in the middle of the night are more challenging. And then the challenge is to remove them. It's costly to remove them. Then we need to store them because we've taken someone else's property, even though it's not supposed to be there. Um, and then, uh, then what do we do with these and the contents? Yeah, and then the other thing is uh, what do we do when uh, there's dumping of mattresses and all kinds of garbage uh, around these boxes? Who do we call uh, to get that uh, garbage removed? So it's the responsibility of the box operator, um, but people are supposed to be putting in those boxes what can fit in them, which is typically the size of a garbage bag that would fit in the chute. These lend themselves to uh, illegal dumping with people doing mattresses. Some of the safety pieces we put in here is to put it under a light so that ho hopefully people are, are less likely to do that. Um, people are always going to be um, you know, potentially looking for ways to illegally dump. The responsibility is on the, uh, the operator of the box, even though um, that's not something they were looking to, to acquire. And who determines the location of these boxes? So the applicant proposes uh, to, to our licensing and permitting division uh, that they'd like to have one at a certain address. We make sure that it's, uh, there's room for it. Uh, that it's not on the public realm and that we have, uh, they, they note that they have the owner's authorization to place it there. And then they get a sticker there that they put they on. They get a the sticker box. that's about 11 by 17 that has a permit number on it which allows us to identify the ones that are permitted and those that aren't. Um, they also help with enforcement, yes. And there it's $100 per permit and it's gone up uh, by inflation every year. So it's around 113 or 115 per box right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll, we have some motions that uh, we'll introduce now. And we'll continue this tomorrow. Who is it? Who's? Councillor Layton? Councillor Layton? Who, who, who seconded the motion?
Neither of them are here, so we can introduce the motion. Um, can't, okay, you know, it's really important that members of council stay in the council chambers. Speaker, no, I would like to move really introduction unfair. of this. It's council really purse. urgent. Okay. Because the funds are required to develop affordable rental housing units at 14 Spadina Road. Okay, on um, favor, carry. Councillor Fletcher. I'm here, Speaker, just to let you know. Thank you. Um, this is a motion I'd like to introduce. This is the second one of these centers that is being closed and just to ask staff to help if they're looking for another location. On um, favor, carried. Councillor Wong Tam, you have two. Yes, that's correct, Madam Speaker. Uh, the first one is uh, specifically building strength upon strength after the Blue, uh, not the Blue Jays, but the Toronto Raptors won the NBA uh, championship. We thought it would be uh, more than time appropriate to put together a plaque uh, initiated by Heritage Toronto. To, uh, to signify uh, Canada's history of basketball excellence. And because Toronto is now a basketball city. On um, favor, Carrie, do you have another one? Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, the St. Lawrence BI is very keen and interested in initiating a, 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 a streetscape improvement program for Nicholas Lane. We'd like to release the, release the funds so they can begin the work this summer. All um, favor, carried. Councillor Grimes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. It's the T Lab appeal. It's uh, the hearing's coming up, so it's urgent to get this on right away. 90 Ash Crescent. On um, favor, carried. Okay, that's it. All right. Do we have any quick releases? Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, I have finished reading. I can uh, release the Integrity Commissioner item. It's on page 11. CC 8.2. I can release that. Which one is that? That's the one we want? Yes. Okay, on page 11, CC 8.2. Who Somebody said that? Somebody else wants to hold it? Who? I didn't hear who said hold. You hold it? Okay. Okay, Councillor Karajanis. So you're releasing it to Councillor Karajanis? Okay. Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're going to try this again. Page 8, Striking Committee, meeting number 2, ST 2.2, Council Member Appointments to Council Advisory Bodies. I think we've made some changes. Sorry, what? Uh, no, it's, it's held under my name. Uh, I think the Speaker. Uh, I th Madam Chair, I, I believe when I spoke to the Clerk, Councillor Cressy re released the item to me, and I actually checked with the desk, and it's being held under my name. If you could clarify that for me. Yeah. Counsel, Councillor Cressy released it to Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Yes. So it's being held in, under my name. And I, so thank you very much. I'll continue to hold it. All right. Um, Councillor. Uh, McKelvey, did you? Councillor McKelvey? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Indeed, I was coming to see you to ask for a point of privilege. I'd like to recognize that we've been joined by Professor Barbara Sherwood Luller, who is the Canadian Research Chair at the University of Toronto, and she has just been awarded the Ensor Kurtzberg Gold Medal, which is Canada's top science award. And this is building on an already good year she's had for 2019, including awards such as uh, being appointed a fellow to the Royal Society of London and being granted the Patterson Award in Environmental Geochemistry from the Geochemistry Society, as well as many other awards. And we're only halfway through the year. Building upon previous honours, uh, she's also received an, a, a companion in the Order of Canada and a former winner of the Ensor Pollyani Prize. Her scientific research has implications for the understanding of nutrient and energy sources in the deep subsurface, 
and has implications for understanding the investigation of life, not just on our planet, but also on others, including Mars. And the techniques she's developed have allowed us to understand the time frames under which water has been isolated from the deep subsurface, and includes discovering water more than one billion years old in the Canadian Shield in Canada. On a personal note, I'd like to point out that Professor Sherwood Lawler has mentored many young women, including myself. I was very privileged to receive both my MSc and uh, PhD under her supervision, and will always be proud that I have spot number 100 on her CV with our paper we co-published. And if you could just please join me in recognizing uh, the presence of Professor Barbara Sherwood Lawler and the big honor she's received this year of the Ensor Kurtzberg Award. Thank you. Councillor Bradford, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. That leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting 8 on June 18, 2019. Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill? Recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Cole. And Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. What happened? What's up there? A motion to introduce the confirming bill carries unanimously 20 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw recorded vote? Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Perks, please. And Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion to enact the confirming bill carries unanimously 20 in favor. Okay, thank you to staff and members of council. Meeting is recessed till tomorrow at 9.30.